This conference will now be recorded. Hey, it is 4.35. We've had some technical difficulties. I think we're on. Um, Councillor Moore, if you can hear us, can you please confirm? Pull that down for a moment. Let me just see. Councillor Moore, if you can hear us, if you could just uh, turn on your microphone. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, 435, the, the beginning of the meeting, if, uh, if we can let the minutes reflect uh, that all members are present. Councillor Moore is joining via go-to meetings. Uh, Councillor Moore did explain to me that there is a, uh, a possibility that she may have to leave the meeting. Uh, to uh, to take a doctor's call, and if so, we certainly understand that. We're praying you get get to feeling better soon. All right. At this time, I would uh, uh, entertain a motion uh, to approve the agenda. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Motion and a second to approve the agenda as proposed. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. All right, approval of the meeting uh, minutes from February the 27th. Did anybody have anything that you felt needed to be changed from the minutes? Any corrections? No, oh, sir. I'd like to make a motion to approve the amendments from February 27, 2023. Second. Uh, that, that's fine. Okay. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. All right. Non action items, project updates, discussion. Right. Mr. Chairman, project update, you have your dashboard report in there? Right. Uh, we started the inclusive part. If you're, if you're, if you're online, online, if you're online, 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 you're if you could please mute your phones for your feedback. Let me see our user profile. Who is caller for that app? I think we got them all. Okay, um, go back in there one more time, please. Go down to Councillor Moore if you can unmute her and uh, just see. Okay, she may have herself muted. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure that she's uh, available to be able to speak to us if she desires. Okay. All right. Go go forward. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Chairman and Committee, we, the inclusive park started on your left is a little layout. Uh, but what they've started doing, they did the grading compaction. Adding our base material that started the header curb and then the crew with the playground equipment immobilized today. So it's off to a very good start. Uh, we're hoping to be done sometime between Memorial weekend and 4th of July weekend, all depending on the weather. And uh, that's the main thing on the weather because you got to put in the playground equipment and you have to put in the the materials for the kid that they fall, and a lot of that's weather dependent and, and very critical. But it's off to a very good start. Next slide. And the next one is the Virginia Park. We also started that one. On the left, you can see some of the concrete that they found from the old school when we started the grading. So there was a lot of uh, demolition rubble that they had to pull out, and then the right picture, they're hauling in the field for the park, but uh, everything's going well. They're starting the concrete and the ADA ramps, but both parks are going very well. This one probably won't be done until uh, July 31st. The reason being, we have a 
60-day watering period. We're making them guarantee and make sure that the water that the grass takes before we uh, release the project. And I stand for any questions on the project dashboard or any of the city projects that engineering is dealing with. Questions? Are you dealing with the aquatic center? Negative. Thank you. I'm, I'm just. Councilor Moore. Just glad, I'm just glad to see the uh, inclusive park finally getting started. I'm glad to see the progress on that. Um, it's been a while, so I'm excited about that. Um, what did you say about the grass? Or do you not have those issues at the inclusive parking, making sure the grass, they or they're not having grass over there? No, the, the inclusive park doesn't include the grass. It'll be phase two. But at the Virginia Park Counselor, we want to make sure when we plant the grass that they have to water for 60 days to make sure that we have a stand of, of grass before they leave. And we're watering it at our at our expense. Uh, yes, it's our irrigation system. As part of the project, we put in the irrigation system. So two things: we'll make sure the irrigation system is working, and then the grass takes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other question? Okay, moving forward. The report. Jennifer. Uh, parking lot. We're waiting for the pre-construction meeting to uh, be scheduled. The drainage study has been completed. Uh, skip over the east water line, but it's, it's on schedule. Uh, rehabs uh, acreage one and two. Both of those are put on hold until uh, July, as well as the uh, runway 1735 uh, PR. Uh, Rep. Hagel, we have taken a drawdown. We have uh, the quarry uh, company in next week to start uh, doing some boring. And Ilea, the chiller, and the fire safety should be in by the end of this week. And next week we'll begin on the roof. So the building should be ready for the first uh, session. Uh, there's been no movement with Trans Arrow and Building 650. Uh, it has been demolished, but in the process, it was noticed that there was a basement that had been filled in with dirt. So we had to go back in and remove all that to ensure that it's not going to sink. So there will be a change order on that project. And which one is that again? Okay. For the new parking lot. All right. Anything else on the airport? Uh, well, so like on the elevator as well. I know you and I have talked about it, but just for two weeks before we get the. Sorry. Any questions, concerns from members? Are there any other councilors here who have some support? You just, Councilor Moore, any questions on the airport? Hearing none, let's move on to the Bad Friends Cemetery project. Next slide, Abraham. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. We wanted to bring you an update on the Mexican Cemetery. It's a grant funded project we got from um, say, uh, about probably six months ago, we interviewed a few architects with the city of Roswell alongside the Chavez County Veterans Group. We chose ASA was our best fit because they saw our vision. The Veterans Group were happy with them with, with the way they presented and exactly how they wanted to envision what they wanted. Um, we had a preliminary design meeting at the, with the Veterans Group and ASA on February 7th. Uh, Chavez County Veteran Board President has approved design, Mr. Jeremy Hurley, which is sitting behind me. And also, we finalized the design. We're, we're completing the renderings that we're going to be showing you here, and we're going to do a little bit of fine tuning, but this is going to be the overall um, design here. We're including the two shelters on the sides. If you notice, it mimics the exact shelter it has now. We did, we did put a cupola on top. We went back and forth on that one a little bit. We made some side adjustments, but the veterans group, along with the uh, Travis County Veterans President, 
approve the design. Um, any one any feelings in Germany? Go right ahead. If you notice the design is going to be, it's going to mimic the shelter exactly. This is exactly where they wanted the height of the walls, the expansion of the red brick. If you go to the next line, you a better look. This gives you a better focal point. With that cupola up higher, it kind of brings the building together and extends the metal one, so it kind of gives you a, a good focal point. Next slide. And here you'll be able to see we're going to be able to accommodate the honor guard, the color guard, either on one left side or right side, and also more founding as well. Next slide. And this is just a, another rendering from, from uh, farther away. I stand for any questions, committee chair. Okay. We've got at least one member. Uh, did you want to? to yeah. Two. Oh, we did. Sorry, I apologize. Would y'all like to share any more with us about the? Uh, no, we're we're very happy and pleased with what Abraham has brought up. Uh, it's exactly what we were looking for from the from the start of this thing, and so we're we're very happy with the progress of everything right now. What do y'all think about the copula as well? Well, uh, we like the idea that. Uh, I know that's where we left the conversation last time I spoke with you. Yeah. But it ties everything in at the uh, real points of the uh, shelter areas. And uh, can someone remind me or not? Did we, did we, I can't remember, is electric in either one of these new stations as well? The new shelters are going to have receptacles on the. Okay. I, I just wanted Let's go in there. Remember that. We are going to, right now, where the lights that protrude up off the ground, we're going to remove all that. And we're going to make them flesh mounted. You have to remove that concrete because we're going to put some some future conduits on the ground for, so we won't disturb it again. We're going to flush mount all that, have a receptacle there as well. We have multiple access points for power. Okay, so what what is it about the the lights you said that they're permanent? The lights are sticking up above the ground right now. They're not installed up, up to code. So we're going to remove that section of concrete. Okay. Put some flush flush mounted lights are so nice and level. It would look a lot cleaner. Okay. Also accessible to with the electricity there as well. I know from the funeral homes perspective, having electricity up there was yes. an important thing for people who need a microphone or singing a song. Some sound system. Did we have any thoughts on the fan that I suggested up up in there uh, no. or an uh, attic fan to pull out the air, hot air, or so push down. Running an electrical to the Ramada is going to be a lot more ex complex and expensive. There's no power in the room. If we can go back uh, to number nine, then. slide nine. To get power, you'd have to get power from underground. We'd have to bore into one of the columns, go up, and then extend the electrical inside. So it'd be a lot more complex. That cobola, when it sits, it's just going to be sitting on top. We're it's minimal roofing, so you're not cutting any roof to put it on. No, we're trying to we're trying to save costs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, questions from city members. Uh, Councillor Best, do you have any more? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Moore, anything concerning the uh, the veterans? No. Okay, thank you. So, uh, what's the next step? Right now, we the architects are doing the construction drawings. Within approximately 45 days, we should be able to have construction drawings. Construction drawings are met, then we, we're going to be able to put it out to bid. And our continuance and all has been taken care of. This yes, um, Mr. Juan Quintas is able to secure us an extension until 2025. 2025? 2025. Okay. Anything else y'all would like to ask? Things going to look really nice. It's going to look really nice. And and to finally, for those that are carrying the flags and stuff, to be able to <laughs> do that properly without fear of you know trying to get that. It's just I've watched and they do a great job with what we've given them to work with. And I know that lifting that entire facility up was just not the best answer. So this is good. All right. Thank y'all. Appreciate it. Hey, let's move forward. The GIS project update. Jeremy, Rich, you guys can leave if you want. Oh, y'all can stay. It's gets. No, I'm no. <laughs> no, thank you. Let the dead bury the dead. The Bible says you stay with us. Yeah. All right.
Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee, you're gonna have a GIS uh, program development. If you remember the GIS been, well, for those of you who've been around, we've been talking about having Roswell have a GIS unit and the GIS facilities for about eight years. This is the first phase. Uh, we did, our, we through our RFP, we got uh, quotes and Souter Miller and Associate was the one that was chosen to do the GIS phase one. Uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago, we hired Glenda as our GIS technician. So in theory, she's uh, employee number one for a GIS unit. And what we're gonna do now is you're gonna have Zachary and Sonia, I believe, from Souter Miller gonna give a quick update. We'll try not to bore you with all the technical terms, but to give you an idea of where we are with phase one of our GIS geographic information system uh, development. Let me check with uh, Zach real quick um, before we get you on. Um, I may have lost the links because we had to restart um, the, the meeting. So um, my question on your end, can you see the screen? Yes. Um, and okay. can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Um, so when I switch, I'm gonna be switching to this. You can still see that. And we've got Correct. you on the side. Okay, Correct. great. All right, so okay. All right. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again for having us. Um, so I'm Zach Tarashi, as Lewis introduced me. I'm in the Albuquerque office for Sauter Miller. Uh, with me is Sonia Hamia, who's in the uh, Las Cruces office for Sauter Miller. And then in person with you guys is Jesus from our Roswell office. And um, like Lewis said, we wanted to give you guys a quick update. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, Glenda. Um, so I guess just a quick quick definition here. Uh, the the bulk of this project is just to to help aid in the development of a successful GIS program within the city. Uh, GIS or geographic information systems, as Lewis said, uh, they're a, they're a science and technology used to analyze, visualize, and store spatial data, uh, and they come in many shapes and forms. Uh, a really basic example of this is just Google Maps. Google Maps is entirely a GIS and uses GIS. Uh, technologies to route you through the city, find address and locations, that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the first task- Can you give me just one moment, I'm sorry. Go if ahead. You can minimize that, we'll read the, oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Zach. Okay, sorry. Um, so for the, the first task on, on this phase one was to conduct a needs assessment. And, and uh, you know, the engineering department for, throughout this GIS development program did not want to work in a vacuum. So we went through and we interviewed not only of the engineering department, but we also interviewed utilities, roads, planning and zoning, solid waste, uh, and planning and I just think I said planning and zoning, but community development. But a lot of the departments we felt could easily use GIS right away. Um, and potentially we're already using GIS. Uh, so we went through an assessment of current capabilities. We put together this long, you know, put you to sleep kind of document, but it runs through a lot of the recommendations we feel uh, the city could uh, use GIS and, and where the needs lie currently. Um, and, and you know, the, the city has already made an investment in GIS through the engineering department, and the goal of the needs assessment was, again, to see how GIS could be utilized throughout other departments within the city. Uh, next slide, please. So through the needs assessment, we also did kind of an assessment of the existing GIS data that the city had on hand. And uh, this is just kind of a quick little slide that shows uh, our assessment through the location, kind of the information or attributal accuracy, the completeness of the data, how well we felt it, it described the entire data set, and then kind of an overall rating to put everything together. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so following the needs assessment, uh, we we crafted a implementation plan that was the task two of this first phase. Um, and it's a series of benchmark initiatives for the city to have what we feel is a successful implementation of GIS. Uh, it, it can also kind of be seen as a comprehensive plan for GIS. And it's a bit of a living document. It might be updated in the future and periodically as the city deems fit. 
Uh, next slide, please. And on the implementation plan, uh, we have certain phases that we feel the city can progress through during its implementation, implementation of GIS. Uh, currently, we're in that one to three years phase, so the building phase. And the goal of the building phase is to create a solid foundation within GIS that the city can leverage for years to come. Basically, a lot of easy wins, quick wins that the city can leverage uh, throughout the future. Uh, next slide, please. In our third task, what we've been doing, it's it's more of our, uh, we, we call it the utility and infrastructure mapping. We've already put together a lot of, uh, or not a lot, but we've put together a few web maps that showcase some of the data the city already had on hand. I think Glenda opened up at least a couple of them. Uh, uh, if you okay. wanna go ahead, Glenda. So yes, so Zach, I will go ahead and open up, um, I think this is the municipal city Correct. municipal map here and I'll just go kind of zoom in and yeah, show that'd be great. what this is looking at, what this is looking at right now. And and so we yeah that that first go ahead is there a question? No, I was going to go ahead and open up layers. I don't know if you can see this screen now that we're not sharing screens, but yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, this first map is as Glenda said, it's more of a community information map. What we did is we took a lot of the existing data the city already had on hand. We tried to kind of uh, compile it into one place, put it into one map. We also pulled data from Chavez County. We pulled in information from FIFA, FIFA, FEMA, um, <laughs> soccer, but, um, and, and we tried to basically compile everything the city already had on hand and could show to the citizens in a really easy to use format. Uh, this right here, again, it's a web map. It's just in a browser. It doesn't require any sort of special program to use. Um, and you can query any of the data in it very easily by clicking on any of the data sets and viewing this kind of sort of pop-up information to it. And um, we, we think it's a pretty relatively easy to use uh, interface for, for folks that aren't necessarily used to GIS. Um, we, we have some other web maps and I, I think Glenda was having a little bit of, of issues getting them open, but um, we... I do have the water and sewer back. And I'll, I'll oh, okay, perfect. That. Yeah, that, let's let's go let's ahead and open that up one. that one. Yeah, that's great. Um, so prior to this project, there were um, quite a bit of the sewer assets mapped out by the city in GIS, and and we compiled that. It was I'd say probably about sixty to seventy percent complete. Um, the the water uh, was not it it was it was mapped out, but it was not in a very efficient. Uh, I guess, storage format for the city to call up and use at any given point. Say if somebody says, hey, I need to know about all the water lines that are at the corner of, of second and main. Uh, it was it was a bit hard. They had to go and find the exact file that had that exact map and then pull up that exact data set. And now they can just zoom in and see the exact uh, assets that were already mapped out in that map, but just more in a holistic uh, sort of synoptic view of the entire city. Um, and, and we have a couple of other web maps, but I don't want to uh, belabor uh, everyone's time. So if we could uh, just go back to the PowerPoint for now, Glenda. Thank you for the demonstration, by the way. And if you could go to the next slide, please. And, and we have a couple of other web maps, but again, I want to be respectful of everyone's time and, and kind of move forward here. Uh, so I, uh, you know, as with everything, what, what are the next steps or what are the next phases? And, and at least on this current phase, we still have two, two tasks left. Uh, one of them is to refine the existing web maps and produce new web maps that are catered to specific initiatives uh, that we already have data that's available for. Uh, we want to add some more layers to that community information maps, things like the political boundaries that are already mapped out, um, and things that uh, any any sort of uh, you know somebody in the city can use, uh, citizens can use, maybe somebody that's coming and that's an outside investor can use and readily available as opposed to uh, historically, it's been something that they've had to reach out to a department in the city to get. Um, we, uh, we're, we're still tasked to do some of those web maps. We're also tasked to do uh, quality assurance slash quality control metrics for the city uh, when it comes to uh, creating, storing and retrieving new GIS data, um, but more of a administrative task there. And then, 
as we push into a second phase on this project, these are what what's shown on this slide is is really where we see this this project going. So to the ETV. We're we're planning on uh, water and wastewater asset refinements. Yes, we have taken a lot of the data that already existed and put it into GIS, but now we see an opportunity to refine this data and make it that much more accurate to be able to uh, give to anybody that may want to use that data. And it's going to concurrently happen with the asset management plan. Uh, we're also planning on aiding in the EMS slash E911 data refinement. Uh, so that's city addressing, city centerline refinement to align with current federal regulations. Uh, and then we, we see this program uh, evolving beyond just the water and sewer mapping for now to extend to planning, zoning, economic development, permitting, code enforcement, those departments we see a lot of quick, easy wins for. And then uh, the kind of last two tasks there is uh, more just aiding the engineering department in terms of getting GIS out to the other departments even more in the city. Uh, that's one between a central, central repository for GIS data or a server for GIS data that makes it easy to use and, and gather between the departments. And then finally, uh, training workshops. Uh, this whole project, we haven't, we haven't wanted to create a product that was too cumbersome for the city to use. We wanted to work within the, the framework of what the city had already invested in and work within uh, the ability of the city. And we wanna keep extending that even further and, and offering training workshops for other employees within the city to uh, learn about GIS and how to use GIS. And that was probably longer than the 10 minutes you gave me, Lewis, but hopefully, <laughs> Hopefully that was short. You did good, Zach. You did good. A couple of questions that I have uh, to start sure. with. Um, sure. um, I see that as Roswell grows, which we hope it grows, we desire to see it grow, and uh, that there, the ETZA uh, comes more and more into play uh, for a lot of these things. Um, what would we be looking at if we if we ventured past city limits into the uh, extraterritorial zoning areas uh in in terms of i just i just think that that's sort of important to know as well uh with this uh, with the uh gis information to be able to know those things and be able to be more readily available for us sure. then we can better appropriate and plan as we're moving forward with things in the etz right and and basically what what happens is you guys might start annexing additional land that's currently outside Correct. of the city limits uh and and so a lot of what we've been trying to do with glenda and lewis is forge a bit of a relationship with the county as well the county has concurrently been producing a lot of data and they've been pushing it to their arcgis online which is just an online cloud-based uh storage repository for gis data and so Glenda and Lewis, that's where the parcels come from. Uh, but they've been able to retrieve a lot of data from the city in a really easy to use manner. And, and so what we find with GIS is that there's a lot of data already out there and a lot of data that you shouldn't be having to produce. And so with, with the flexibility of the system that we're operating within, it's it bringing in these new data sets that are currently outside the city limits tends to be very easy. Is, is the way that was it's probably too long of an answer compared to what you were maybe so expecting. Make it still short, yes so i would just say that uh maybe those are conversations for you and Lewis Jaramillo. those are conversations if you look at item number 14 that's kind of already, already in the works and i would like to just add a little bit on that note so um a lot of the mapping that we do have you know we've got base mapping which is where all our boundary information is coming from. And we've got ETZs, boundaries, we have um, district boundaries. We, so that's just kind of what this has all been about, converting that data into GIS readable data. And, and there's a lot of uh, regulatory uh, groups, mm -hmm. i.e. FEMA is one of those. They already have a lot of Chavez County already mapped out. It's a lot of those floods on it. It's a lot of the data that Glenda might need to use when it comes to the Lomers, Clomers, uh, all of that information as you guys start to expand into those areas that may not be mapped out exclusively for the city. Mr. Chairman and committee, one of the important things in my mind 
is the the, the EMS, the emergency system, and uh, the addressing, because we have some problems with the addressing when it popped up to 911, and then they go out to the air center for one, uh, they can't always find it. And sometimes in an emergency situation, minutes could be critical in somebody's lives. So that's one thing that in this next phase, we would have to work with the airport, we'd have to work with planning and zoning, and making sure that all the addressing and the future addressing meshes. So as the addresses are added and created, they get into the GIS. So when 911 gets a call, they go first time to the address they've been sent to, not the second time. Right. But that's phase two. Uh, and one of the reasons we're having this conversation now is because we are in budget process and engineering will be presenting uh, phase two requests to keep on going. Okay. Questions from uh, any members? Comments? I have a question. I'm not a committee. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, the bus transit could use this so well. I wish we were part of the conversation. Um, we need to put, especially our side route bus stops on this so that um, it will aid our software program when we get it because it's gonna have a rider's app and that uh, the GIS information is extremely important. We can add you very easily to phase two, okay. not a problem. Great. Test. Committee members? Did you catch that, Zach? I did catch that. Okay, side note, put it on the list. Pull up for me if you put those that are online so okay. I can just see. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you all for your time. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Sonia. Solid waste DDL needs. So, committee chair, committee members, that's the uh, infrastructure meeting we had while I was requested to kind of dive into the CDO. Um, I guess crisis we're having right now, I call it a crisis. The reason I'm saying that, the, the city of Roswell right now is experiencing a very high uh, CDO um, vacancy rate. And what I wanna go through, I, we kind of looked around toward the different counties. You know the next slide, Brenda? So the solid waste farm is a lot of 22 CDO drivers. And we currently have nine vacancies as of, as of Friday, we're gonna have 10 CDO vacancies. Um, in the last three to four months, we have zero applicants have been coming forward to apply for these positions. There's an industry-wide shortage. So when I say industry-wide, I'm talking about Roswell, Chavez County, um, Artesia, surrounding areas, RISD as well. Um, like I said, um, in the last six months, we've had minimal, minimal people apply for the job. The city needs an avenue or a program to backfill these city needs. So either some kind of internal mechanism so we can train CDO drivers from within and then graduate them into a CDO position, learn them, teach them our way. The city hourly rate is, a, is lower than the state average according to the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics. Some of the extra interviews that we've been having lately with the last employees that have left, one of the major factors that they're walking away is um, pay. It's not really the department, the environment or the city, because we do offer good benefits, sort of weekends, home. Um, they do have a lot of holidays as well, sick leave and, and vacation. That was one of the major factors. Next slide, Linda. So here's the reference for the um, US Bureau of Labor Statistics. It kind of shows our average where, where, we, where we should be. Next slide, Linda. Uh, leave there for a moment. I want to zoom in a little bit, Council. Okay, make sure I zoom up. What are we at right now? Is that in your negative one? It's like three sides down. So it's 2190 up there. So here, I, I can transition next one. So here, so I'm talking about solid waste, right? So we're looking at transit. Transit has five vacancies. Water has five, streets has two, parks has two. And I wanna put on their facilities because let's say we were to develop a program in-house, what we could do is other departments can benefit from that. If we have a CDL driver within facilities, they use a boom truck that requires CDL, where they can go change those light bulbs to those um, telephone poles that are 30, 40 feet high as well. So there's there's some flexibility within within the city. Next slide. 
So a pay incentive of the 12 city, county, and state governments we surveyed, four of them contracted out of CDL positions, were unable to contact them. So some of the cities just flat out contacted out the entire service. Four of them offered no incentives at all. Two had no vacancies at all. And I'll show you on the next slide where the two um, no vacancies are. Here, you, you're going to see the starting pay here. <laughs> Las Cruces, Rio Rancho, Cafe, Roswell. Carlsbad. Carlsbad is one of the one of the county, one of the cities that has a very high incentive. They have a zero vacancies, and people are just waiting for those jobs to open up. Well, and NMDOT as well. But let's be fair about that. Uh, we had the, the the income of Carlsbad, and, and if we were right there sitting on top of an oil field, we would have you know. So so just to give you another perspective, to Chavez County. They're, they're sitting at eight open positions right now and their starting pay is at 15 as well. Okay. And so this entire table, we put it in the graph in the next slide for you. And that, it gives you a quick visual representation of where we're at um, in relation to some of, the, some of the cities around us. So pay is definitely a contributing factor. Next slide. Here's some of the incentives graph for you. So obviously that's Cruces is pretty high, Carlsberg is high again. Economic factors are a big incentive for them. <laughs> Next slide. Here's our vacant, here's our open positions in comparison to the, to the cities around us as well. Next slide, I want to touch on some challenges here for you. The private sector. So what's we've been noticing the private sector has been coming towards our drivers and asking them, hey, look, if you come up with us, we'll give you a two, three, four, five thousand dollar incentive bonus. We can't compete with that. Obviously, our pay rates as well. Is a very aggressive competitive market, which we cannot compete with the oil fields and the private sector as well. But the one benefit we do have, we have a very good benefit program, weekends, holidays as well. As well. Next slide, Linda. Some of the recommendations, some of the discussions actually that I wanted to bring forward. Um, at this point, not only my department, but as well as water and streets will have to be involved in and parks as well. And I have a discussion and input from the department heads on the creation of a CDL or heavy equipment um, program slash trainer. Um, CDL and heavy equipment tra in-house trainer, uh, we'd have to develop a funding mechanism. We'd have to work with HR and also the finance department. The trainer is to conduct three to six month refreshers, provide training post-accident for employees department, random CDL and heavy equipment evaluation citywide. We'd have to rewrite some of the CDL Citywide CDL position to include a six month completion date to obtain a CDL. So that line right there, we, we can develop employees from within and bring, bring them up to that level and bring them up to that, that level of pay. Um, the level of CDL A or B will be determined by the department head. Water's needs, street needs, all the waste needs, and parks needs are they're all different. So it'll be up to the department head. Um, in talking to legal, there is an ability to create a one to three year commitment for new employees when they come on board. We did, look, we did look at third party testing. If we were to train them in house, we'd have to send them out to, for example, ENMER for testing, it'd be $200 per, per, um, per operator. And, we, and then another recommendation, if the, if the committee council would like to look at it, would be an issue in RFP for CDL trainers with multiple awards citywide. And then in doing that, I wanted to, next one, next slide. Then. I wanted to do a, just a quick analysis so the, the first line of trainer all the way across, that would be a in-house city. Now, depending on the type of insurance that they choose, that end number would change slightly, but it would be about $75,000 to have an in-house trainer. We use a pay rate that's already, pay grade 56, it's already built for a trainer. It's within the city. We just have to expand on it. Now the CDO RFP would be, per class would be $4,300. $4, you see how it, how it builds up. So if we did an RFP, we're probably looking at about $103,000, $860,000 per year if we're running that many people to the class. Um, one of the benefits in talking to the other department heads is having that CDO trainer in-house. What we could develop is they can do pre and they can do post-accident reviews, um, ongoing refreshers to us citywide. Also get our CDO drivers and bring them in and just do a refresher as, as, as we deem necessary and also a lot of our heavy equipment as well. Um, next slide, there should be questions. And at that, um, the Chair, I stand for any questions. <laughs> if you can go back uh, to the slide, please. Just uh, roll, keep going. 
Yes, uh, uh, number 23. Uh, oh, let's see here. Go down a little bit more. Uh, go right there. Take one. Let me see it. 12 cities, uh, county and state government survey for contractors. Who are those four? Those were going to be, uh, for example, Alamogordo. They contracted out some of the stuff. I don't know the other ones offhand, you know. Farmington was one uh, part of Albuquerque does contract out. Yeah. There were cities that were comparable to us, but they just contracted out because Food of the for the dollar no incentive. I think it should be in on the next slide, Linda. It would be Rio Rancho, obviously Roswell, and MDOT in Chavez County. And up to the slide again. And, uh, and we look at Clovis or Catalas. I think Clovis might have been one of the other ones that contracted out. And I don't think we've got a response from Catalas. And Artesia, did we look at them? We did look at Artesia as well, but we didn't get no response. We were having trouble communicating with them. But the I was looking at my counterpart there and didn't get a response in time. So if we invested the money in to a trainer, what what else is part of that proposal to sort of ensure that we're going to get the CBL drivers and keep them? So talking to legal, what they were thinking about is a one or three year commitment for them to bring them in. Train them, keep them for that three-year commitment. After that, we can they can leave. Um, we'd have to coordinate with HR and coordinate with finance, see what our return on our investment is on those employees. Um, and build, grabbing them from within the city or developing them from within the city would be a lot easier than it would be from bringing them from the outside. But there'd still be a one to three-year commitment, correct? Yes, from from that CDO driver that we train specifically. But even if they've been with us for ten years and we Put them through the CDL, there'd still be a three year commitment. We can develop that with legal, however they want to draft it, or however the committee recommends, we can draft that as well. So, uh, one of y'all decided the, uh, uh, the financial per CDL driver would be to put them through this kind of programming? To put them through the program? Well, it would be the existing positions we have now that are already funded, so that we already budgeted for those salaries already. So the, oh, about the commitment from the instructor. What's, what's the cost for, for class? It's four thousand three hundred and twenty-seven dollars and fifty cents for one CDL class. That's Six. what we've estimated if we're paying a person. If we were to uh, contract it out, so That's the contract. trainer would have all the materials, everything available here. He would do the training portion. Then we would sub them out at a two hundred dollar cost to the community college for testing. So what is the breakdown? Do that. Us. Well, we just we just put somebody through at transit through the CDL train. Uh, yeah, it's expensive. through a through an outside organization, and it costs us around four thousand dollars plus the two hundred dollars for the test. But that's not what it's going to cost us if we have an in-house. So what is going to be that cost? We can, well, it would depend on how many people we train annually. The, 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 I guess what I'm getting at is how are, how are we going to determine if someone uh, works eight months? Then they resign, they forfeited the contract, if you would say, that we put have been serving for with us for three years. The attorney told us it would be prorated. But, but what's that number? I guess what I'm asking, what prorated for what? What is that number that we're looking at that we're going to be prorating off of? If it's an in-house trader? Right. Um, we'd have to, we'd have to, make we'd have to run that analysis. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, I'm here somewhere. We, this isn't the first rodeo we've had in the CDL. All these years, I mean, we, we've tried so many different things. We we did, like you're talking about, paying for them to go for the class. We still couldn't get them. It seems like as soon as we get them, get somebody hired in, uh, the oil fields, because we drive in there, they have a shortage as well at the, the oil field. And they're able to pay significantly more than what we're able to. And then, but that's what these. And I'm not 
being offensive to anyone's CDL in here, but the younger generation, whether it's the CDL drivers or police officers or whatever, like you said, our benefit package is phenomenal compared to most of these other places. But a young person that's 20 year, 21, 23, 25 years old, they're not looking at when they're 45 years old, they're looking at right now, I take home today. Whereas I, as 48 year old, I'm looking more at what am I going to be taking home when I'm 65 years old? I'm not as worried about the today as I am the tomorrow. So, you know, that's that's been a problem for how long? You know, it's, it has been a problem statewide, I think, for some kind of CDL drivers. So, the thing that I haven't tried to just as address is that contract where we, because we have employees, currently employees, that would, I, I think, jump out of the opportunity because they don't have to pay for but if we have them, we up front the cost, get them trained, and they sign a contract with this, then that's prorated out over the period of what one to three or whatever it is. Uh, that is the one thing that we haven't tried that I'm aware of in the last four years. Mm -hmm. CR England does that. They train their drivers and sign a contract for two to three years. Which is a cross country shipping. Right. So, uh, and I, that's why I like obviously that's the one thing that we haven't tried really is that because I, I know I get people all the time thinking, but they just don't have to upfront cost because it's very expensive. You know, paying for the front coming in or paying for whatever how they got it for individuals to go on their own. Take the test, get their CDL license, and find a vehicle to even test with without having to go to college. It's almost impossible. So you're going to have to go out and find a, a company or a facility that has the vehicles for you to do the testing. But we can do that in house, get them on a contract. Uh, we've asked it to, uh, as we're going through the budget stuff, this started today. Uh, and this is one of the proposals when we've done this in Astro about that. Outside, uh, the the testing would still have to be done outside, correct? Testing. So, which brings up another thing: how far backed up are they on testing right now? They're not. They're not. Because I know at one time they were really backed up. Um, Councilor. So I think my question is: if we if we have an in-house trainer, I assume that our fire trucks have to have CDL drivers. No, no they're just. Exactly. But we have to have CDL with. P on it for the transit, right? The personal? As long as it's more than 15 passengers, yes. How many do we have that's more than 15 right now? All of them that we didn't take seats out of. So we've uh, stripped seats out of a couple. Um, and we're getting some smaller buses, but those will only be adequate for our side routes, not Main Street. Main Street needs to be a full size bus. I think what my question is, there's other departments that could also use this, such as, <clears throat> as water and all of that. Next question is, we use our fire training center for other towns to come in and be trained. Is that an option to bring in other CDL drivers from other towns? That city pays our, our driver, because you've got this man here 365 days a year. You're not going to have <laughs> that many drivers come in and commit three years to get their training. So can you bring in other towns where they pay for those drivers to be trained within Roswell? I would, but we don't have the capability to suit CDLA because we don't have a tractor trailer rig. But let me get Mike, so. Uh, oh, uh, thank you, Council, uh, that's this question. Absolutely, as far as any time we're gonna close, close the class or something like that, we do the same thing with the fire department right now. We reach out to the tribal communities. We got a good class coming up. If they're interested to put in boys in it, then they do. We can do the same thing in theory with this team now. The class A or whatever for the attractive trailer rigs. There may be some some communities that uh, I know the county would, the county that they run tractor trailer rigs. Yeah, they the, the, the cities and stuff. Like I don't know that they do. Then it would be an option to be able to have. Uh, and you could probably tag team through. with the county on their rigs because I know they have them to practice with. So talking to the county, talking to Joe West, they would be interested to do some kind of collaboration or cooperative with us. 
when we do some kind of training, they'll bring somebody in. We can develop an area where we can train them. Somewhere we have a pool. For example, for my department, we have a very specialized equipment. Having them for that six months, we'll be able to learn, see, hey, are you going to be able to operate on the passenger side of the vehicle? Are you going to be able to navigate the alleys? We'll be able to flesh out a lot of that stuff during that six months as well. But the county is interested in doing a cooperative. They'll be glad to work with us. So, um, sorry, Councilor uh, Bass, did you have anything else? No, I just think that would behoove the city in a better situation than it would paying 4000 you know, forty five. $4,500 a head to send them and then you just lose them because you're not signing a contract with them when you send them off to well, this. Well, I guess you could, but contracts are broken every day. Committee Chair, we also spoke to the uh, state um, training facility as well. They, they are only tailored for the state employees only. They're not open to having that um, type of cooperation. Their policies and procedures won't allow for that right now. They'll be glad to open their facility for us to have a really big facility. Well, and we don't want to be in business, but we want to be able to have our our drivers. I mean, we have the vehicles or we're getting the vehicles, can't use them without drivers, so. So, yes, Councillor Moore. Um, my concern is even if we pay to have a person, a trainer, if we don't have the people, what good is to pay somebody $75,000 and we can't find 24, 28 people to train. And what is that person you say going to be doing throughout the year? They're not training 24, you know, three all year. So we would have to come up with something else for that person to be doing because you don't train CDL drivers all year. And if the whole state and the city is, you know, is district wide and county wide, the shortage. How are we going to find some people to make it conducive to pay a trainer? I know we need them. I understand that. I'm, that's not my problem. And if we got that, that's not a problem. But you understand, we still got to find the bodies to train. So, Committee Chair, if I can answer Council Moore's question. So, ideally, that position and talking to HR, what we're looking at is having that, posi having that position already do CDO training as well, but doing heavy equipment training regularly. People come in, people phase out or phase in, have them do heavy equipment training as well, do post-accident reviews on the equipment, um, review new equipment coming in, even the water has very specialized equipment. We can tailor that person to con do continual refresher training all year long. That was the ideal situation for that. So do most CDL trainers do heavy equipment training as well? Because most CDL trainers that I know of are dealing specifically more or less with uh, uh, large body passenger uh, with tractor trailer, that kind of stuff for state advancement, not necessarily with specialized equipment. Some of the trainers at the at the NMDOT, and we actually have one individual within the city now that was a trainer there. They did CDL, heavy equipment training, accident reviews, refreshers, um, multiple training throughout the city. So they're not only specialized in one area, they specialize in multiple areas. So we can utilize them. Anywhere, any department could utilize that. So y'all feel the pay that's being presented is is, is that's that's all a norm for what someone who does that, or where did that figure come from? So the pay grade came from HR that they utilized for 56. When you get to the 76 thousand dollars, that's all the extra benefits that we pay. That's what would be the city's cost. That hourly rate would probably be in the range of 24 dollars an hour for a trainer. I just didn't know if that's a norm for the industry or that pay grade. Yeah, the pay grade came from HR. I can't speak for HR, but I'm sure I can follow up with you. Lewis, you have a question? No, you've got a chat. I think I'll stay with Schneider National. Okay. Any comments come in from the chat? Do the trucking companies have similar contract employment commitment clauses at one year? As the only employee of uh, class 34 in the state with Schneider National. So, you know, it, you know, that's where I'd, I'd like you know, to be hearing from legal how you write that in, and, and again, how, how do you collect? That, that's going to be a concern for me as well. I, I'm all game to do whatever it takes to, you know, to, to do this correctly. But, um, you know, how do you collect? You get someone that's making how much did we say an hour? For the trainer? Uh, no, for the employee. 16, 1634. 16, 
bucks an hour, you know, and then uh, they go to the oil field for 24, 25, 30 dollars an hour. Uh, how are we going to collect on that 3,000 or whatever? Garnish number? their check. Garnish their check. And tell Committee them. Chair, this is kind of like a discussion item. We want to explore where it goes. We can definitely talk to legal, see how we can incentivize for those six months at increments. Even at, we can do an increment of the, the incentive at a three month, a six month, at a one year. We can space it out however we need to space it out. But the discussion kind of leads us in that way. We can definitely go to legal and have those discussions. Um, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, so, in these other cities that you've mentioned, you noted the incentives. How many of those incentives were actually paying for possible CDL training? Was any of that actual? So, all those those are strictly just, CDL incentives. Just straight up, three thousand dollars. Nothing was actually in because I mean, if you're actually going to train somebody and pay for their CDL, that in itself is a, a, an incentive. Um, so. trying to think of how I want to phrase this. Um, uh, you noted that you had several people leave. You have someone leaving this Friday. You've had several people drop out. What was the reason your people left? I mean, did you do an exit interview? So HR did the last two, did the exit interview. Someone that's leaving on Friday, he's actually a retiree, um, Mr. Dwayne Wolf. Here's a visual representation of all the vacancies. Counselors, you can take a look. Oh, that's going back to your question. It sure burns that gets me. No. For the record. So to ask your question, uh, it was the pay. So they were going from a, um, a first shift job with weekends off, holidays off, to a night shift job with a night shift, no days off. And definitely more pay, but they're going to be away from the family for a lot more. So a lot of people that we've interviewed, they like it here because they're going to spend more time with their families. They have a, a good shop, good place to work. It's just that the pay is not sufficient enough when they start taking out their retirement and insurance and how some of is rising too as well. Were you able to ascertain where they're going? So the last two I went, they went to Dobrino. They weren't very happy about it. They wanted to stay here, but because of the pay incentive, they, come, they had to go. They went to Dobrino. We had two other ones that went to some private companies with a $3,000 bonus, an annual bonus. So that's that kind of incentive we can't, we can't fight with that. No. We can't compete with that. I'm sorry. So I do understand, Mr. Chair, on your concern with the younger people. Is there, um, are there employees that are interested, have been with us for a while, that are interested in moving up to the step of moving within and creating the workforce from within? So we have existing city employees throughout the city, and this will create a sort of upward mobility for them. They have already invested time. They've already been here for a couple of years. They do what they would like to look at in CDR. Hey, I can step up my career and make a little bit more money, move, move up. There is going to be that need. So unfortunately, some of the departments that are going to fill that board are going to be like streets and parks. They end up coming from there and coming, coming straight to solid ways. But it does give them an avenue to. So I would have to say that about 80 to 90 percent of my phone calls from constituents is regarding sanitation, water. Basically, it's all about infrastructure. So, I, I have one one last question and one comment. What is the? How is this affecting the overall service that you're providing to our community? This kind of shortage, because as I see things and as my constituents see things. Your work, your work, and your work is a priority to our community. So our service level on the bulk trash program has significantly dropped. So if you notice from that very first column, this is the automated collections in our org chart. Everybody in the middle chart is a bulk trash. They shift over. CDO drivers shift over. We'll leave, we'll leave two, two drivers within the commercial route. The bulk trash <laughs> service drops down to minimal levels. And you can see that we need to drive around the city as well. So when we shift that over, it takes a drastic impact on, on the um, overtime. The reason I say overtime is because I have to generate a mandatory overtime to have the drivers fill in those gaps throughout the city. So now our quality of service, our service levels are dropping on the bulk side. 
for all of our function is automated collection. So when we have time, we adjust money within our budget to help with the bulk trash. So that's where we kind of have the issues. Um, actually, on um, March 23rd, we initiated a um, mandatory overtime for the RC, all of our CDL drivers, as well as um, my supervisors are driving trucks as well. Fernando, uh, Phil, and Jason, those are my three supervisors. They're all driving trucks as well. Anybody within the department of CDL, they're not on this mandatory overtime list. So yes, it's a drastic impact to, to that service citywide. I, I had a gentleman, Mr. Steve Stevens on Van Buren, that you assist me with, and he called me out of concern because he needed assistant, assistance picking up the neighborhood trash. But he, he was extremely shocked at the fact that it was going to be six weeks before anyone could at, could get out there. Can you can you explain what so that we, six weeks is? We did a we did an on call service. As people come in and it's a critical, we verify them first and we put them on an on call. Instead of servicing the entire city that we used to before when we had seven, five to seven uh, low trust drivers, we put them on an on call service. So we go, we verify if it's uh, public nuisance, if it's a health and safety issue, we mobilize really quick and we can get it cleaned up. But until we get that rotation, as we fill in on Wednesdays, as usually when we run bulk trash pretty hard, and now that we initiate Saturdays, we have to work our way around the city. So it takes that long to get all the way around the city because we're going through every single alley throughout the city. So about 330 miles of alleys that we have to cover. So that's why that, that lead time is so long. But they do have options where they can bring it to the gar to, to the landfill something for free with their water bill, or they can do an on-call service, which we are pretty economical. If you call a grapple truck to your house to get clean up some stuff you brought up, that the price is actually reasonable compared to our competitors. But majority of people don't do that. They'll throw it in the alley. Hey, it's your job, you can get it. So that's kind of the initiatives too, is working on the other end, we're working on rewriting the ordinance, which will be coming up here pretty soon. Thank you, Nelson. Right, thank you. The only thing that, and I'm not trying to rain on the parade, I want to see what, what legal is going to say with it, but I want it to be stiff enough with it that we don't have. So I think that our, our, our current employees, I think we'll probably see retention with them. They, they probably already enjoyed working with the city life, what they have, that moving out to be everything for them, I think will retain. I, I just don't want to see a situation where, like you said, one of them had a 3,000 sign-on bonus. They're probably paying more as well. Uh, uh, they, you know, making it where we're just, you know, going through the training, and uh, we may get affordable enough for them to just go ahead and leave. You know, you know, saying that through the bonus and the extra pay, they're able to pay their debts to the city and move on. I wanted to, you know, to show us some because we've just never been able to have everlasting. Not been able to overcome that. And I think that communities, especially in our area where we live, is going to be a little bit different looking than farming to or it's going to be or uh, you know, because those other places is just going to look different because of that whole field. So okay. So what is your next step? I guess moving talking with legal or there's open discussion if the committee wants to send me. I can get with legal and see what that contract would look like. And I can bring it back. I can bring it back here and present it to you if you'd like to look at the, how that looks like. And also engage HR to look at the in that position, the total cost for that position. Which if committee chooses to do that, I can I can do that as well. Okay. Thoughts from committee members? I think an in-house trainer would be behoove us for safety reasons on top of teaching. I think it would it would make Miss Bell very happy that we have a safety person out there watching. I absolutely support additional information, having some legal review. Um, I, th I see a lot of benefits, and I do. Like I said, I consider their pay a priority. You want it back next month, Chairman? Yeah, bring it back to us next month, uh, Council Moore. Do you have anything else? Thank you. And I'm glad that Abraham has, uh, has, uh, has uh, humbly accepted that it'll all come out of his budget. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure something out. Okay. All right. And that, that'll be something that if we move through this bench, there's basically multiple parts of the where we.
place that through and get that figured out as well. Okay, so I look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, the next uh, chapter twenty-one, Article One. Same with Abraham. So we're going to follow the model here with that Mr. Glenn has been using. For our updates for so chapter twenty-one, just give you some background, uh, committee chair. Thank you for the opportunity. The current chapter twenty-one of the Cedar Ross Ordinance was last fully updated. 1984. So a complete update was done next for. So it has two articles and it's eight pages. It's been edited in little bits, bits and pieces, but it's not been modernized. Our new fam our new landfill permit is expected to be completed by the end of FY24, to be June 2024. So what we want to do is start developing and start modernizing the, the chapter and get it um get it built and then our new permit kicks in. So when our new permit kicks in, what that's going to do is going to change a lot of things that we do within the city. Next slide, Linda. So here's our workflow process. We're going to follow kind of follow the same thing Mr. Robert Glenn has been doing. Um, I'll bring the article from the Solid Waste Department. We'll take it to legal. Legal approves it. I'll bring you the infrastructure and the discussion. And he added that you see. I come forward that you um, would like to flush out or discuss further. We could take it back to edits, re bring it back to the process. Otherwise, we'll approve it and we'll move on to new to new um, articles. Um, next, Go ahead. we'll present an article for discussion at the first meeting, which will be this one. Presented for an action and edits. In the next meeting, introduce a new article for discussion. A rough timeline is has an ordinance reviewed at the end of November before going to full council. At the request of infrastructure, committee chair, you can send the ordinance to any subcommittee you'd like to go to. Uh, Fee-related items, or if it's it'll be general services or finance, anything legal or law related, we'll go to legal. Enforcement related, public safety legal, and we'll route it back straight back to you. Next slide. So article 21, chapter 21, article one, it's an open discussion. A lot of it, we, we really fine tune a lot of the, the um, definitions. There's a lot of definitions within the, within the ordinance that are non-existent. And some of the language we have there, for example, that we're referring to racks. I don't know if anybody remembers, so I remember going up here, the racks and the garbage can in the back, those actually we put our garbage cans. And it's actually still referred to it today. So we're gonna remove all that stuff. Expand, the definitions are expanded. <laughs> Very detailed. We pulled from a lot of different um, communities around us. And also, we want to codify the department's authority. So there, you'll be able to see where the solid waste department will be able to have a lot more, um, a lot more teeth or a lot more authority when they're enforcing these um, ordinances. I leave this open for discussion. What we'll do is you have your blue green binders from high school, and then <laughs> you can uh, you can review them. I'll collect them. I'll collect them at city council. Any kind of edits that you might have or discussion, I'm always available. You can make those edits. And we'll just kind of work through this process little by little. Um, November is kind of the deadline we wanted, but as it grows and develops, if we have to coordinate, we have to be in conjunction with a lot of other uh, chapters within uh, the city code. So I don't want to do something that's going to trump what water is doing. I don't want to do something that's going to trump what code enforcement is doing. So this will be a lot of interaction. So this is definitely needed. It's going to be a long process, but if you take it chapter by chapter, it would be good. There's one ch there's one chapter I do want to introduce in developing this. It's, um, we develop a new, uh, we're going to introduce a new chapter. Our current ordinance right now does not refer to illegal dumping in any way, shape. So it, it's causing a public nuisance. It doesn't even define um, illegal dumping. So that can help us curb the bulk trash issue the good up in citywide because right now we really don't have an avenue unless we catch somebody red-handed and we do literally take it for it so it's, it's very difficult so it's going to help us in multiple aspects going forward um as with that um if there's any discussion on the articles nothing here is many definitions nothing really stands out but um i'm open for any questions Councilors. I'm good. Gentleman behind you, I think, wants to say something, huh? Yes. Uh, you know, I'm not to speak to you, but that contract that you guys do for the CDL, if it goes through, I don't know how many 
you know, future employees are leaving in a going for it. No, it's only you know, you know, the pay rate isn't the best. So far, if, even if it does go new, you know, how many people are going to go for it? It's, I mean, and people, you know, we should be giving it. I did need a few thousand or whatever much it costs. I don't understand how that can be. I can be paying what, you know, it's in the end of the day. You have to be paying for that. Like you said, the city is growing. And it's, you know, it's a little bit. You're fine. No, I hear you. You know, the alleys are pretty bad. And the, the fibers, I'm doing pretty well. And, you know, 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 Thank you. And also, uh, I just saw your text. Uh, Rita had a question as well. I have the a question. Um, number one, the two brothers that left. That just left on 317. There was more than the pay that they were after. Also, the CDL drivers, yes. How many of you are rear loaders? How many of you you've done the rear loading? How many of you are grapplers? How many of you are side loaders? Side loaders don't need anybody else, but what do you tell the people that are sitting on the right hand side? You're not as important as the CDL driver. Doesn't the rear loader need that person on the on the um, right side of the truck? Doesn't the grappler need the person on the right side of the truck? For God's sake, you got a janitor working a rear loader, and he's not making half the money that these people are. I mean, I'm just saying we need the CDL drivers. Yes, we probably need to give them more money, but you can't tell them. Oh, you're more important than these guys because they can't do their job without the right hand person or the scraper or the bulldozer. And a lot of these things are down. If we need to pick up trash and trash is a big problem. They are working six days a week. When do they get off? They, they don't get holidays. They're working holidays. Oh, come on. We, we've got to help these people. They are exhausted. Some of them work 12, 14 hours a day. Because they're not any, they're not getting out there. The two, um, Philip and Jason, are were working today. You're not none of you are Philip or Jason, are you? Okay. They, um, they're they're working because they don't have enough people. We need to do something because trash. Everybody, everybody generates trash every single day. And then what happens when you are? You know, you can't get in. You have to go back and you charge $65 to go back. You get the $65? No, you don't. But you're working longer. And, you know, these people have, how many of you have families? Yeah. So how many of you have kids that they go to ball games and they have, you can't do that with them. I don't know who you are, but I know who you are. Um, I, I, I have a list of the people here and how much they make. They, they don't get paid enough for God's sake. I mean, they're like our firemen and our police. Well, that's what I was going to say is it, yeah. I wish that was the only problem we had. We have the I same know. problem with our police department. Yes. Uh, we have the same problem with our fire department. I would say we probably have the same problem with water department. We probably have the same problem with, yeah. and the list just goes on and on. And uh, it's the same pocket it's all coming out of. But there's a reason why the CEL drivers are leaving. Oh, the sanitation. There is a reason why they are leaving. Maybe they don't tell the other people. Maybe they don't tell HR, but they tell other people. And yeah, 
the brothers are leaving. The brothers have left because you know who the brothers are, don't you? Um, let me see. The brothers. The brothers are Jose and Carmel. Yeah, they left. Not not only because of pay, but how they are treated at the landfill. That's why by sanitation. That's why they're leaving. So let's get the whole story out. If we treat them right, if we say, you know, every every holiday you guys are working, aren't you? Every almost every Saturday you guys are working because trash is trash. It is all over the place. And it has to be picked up or the city will be like Paris, will be like New York for those of you who knew what happened in New York. I'm just saying we have to do something to help these these drivers. Coming up. And you don't want to see trash on the street. Yeah. Thank I'm, you. I'm just, no, I hear you. I, I just, I, and I'm not being funny when I say this, but uh, it, it, it's a problem. You know, I was just, and it's not just in our community as well. I was just in another community of New Mexico that's near a, um, where there's a Walmart, and then there's this massive, massive, massive vacant lot next to the Walmart, and it was absolutely littered with trash. Mm -hmm. And I was just shocked when I, I talked with someone from the city to approach on it. It's just people are getting, you know how our whims are, people getting into their uh, vehicles, you know, and they lose a receipt or they lose a bag. And it goes off, and it's just um, it, it's a problem uh, that we're facing, and there's a shortage mm -hmm. and everything. I think this is a step. I mean, I wish that we had all the solutions. But I think this is, if we can make something like this work, we need to look at this as a potential problem. But I don't think it's going to fix it. I, I don't think it's going to fix it. I think we'll get some more CDL drivers, but they're still going to be the problems, and we're going to have to bring on staff to stay on top of the equipment. Get the right equipment. It's always going to be something as we go around the loop that we're going to bump into. I mean, they're having to use what we call brown pride, the um, the older units, because some of their units are in. You've got eight side loaders, you've got four seat, four rear loaders, and I think two grapplers. And there's always one or two of them down. And so they have to go to the old unit. And you work 12, 14 hours a day for five days and then you work eight or nine hours on that Saturday, they get exhausted. And that, that's where safety comes in. Point well taken, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. Back on to the, where we were with the, uh, the uh, ordinance amendments. So chapter 31, like I said, it's just open for discussion. If there's anything you see that you would like to, you've added something out, just saw it. Uh, on page 51, and this is just, and this part stuff we'll talk about later. I know y'all will be working through this, but uh, um, on page 51, which is seven of the ordinance rewrite, uh, at the top is motor vehicle. Any vehicle which is designed by self-propelled and travel along ground shall be included, but not limited to automobiles, buses, motorbikes, motorcycles, motor scooters, trucks, tractors, da, 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 da. but then right underneath that motor vehicle tire, it's exhibited only to a passenger car or a light truck tire. So does that not include motorcycles? That not include scooters or tractors or golf carts or? It would include all times. Okay, so we need to, that needs to be, that just popped off. I just, I don't know, just saw it. <laughs> just saw it. That's so I will take a better look at this. Um, um, I wanted to see really where we were going, what we were going to be discussing. Then I'll take a deeper look at it. <laughs> Committee members. We just need time to go over it, I think. So can I, can I propose this? We can take the time to walk this page by page tonight. We have a whole lot of other things to deal with. Um, can we just make this a priority for next meeting uh, to, to and if our counselors can take what we have here. If you have any questions or concerns, get with staff so that we can start as they can get that information together so that this can go along. I, I'm not one to just say, okay, that's good. We move on to the next one. I want to go every page and, yep. and make sure we get it right. So we're just, you know, I just want to say, Diego has it. He has a huge workload. He said he's going to he's gonna jump in and, into it. But we'll stay as well. on top of it as quickly as y'all are here. So as you do it, you see a red line in front. As soon as you hit that tab, you'll see a clean version. Mm -hmm. Also, at the very end, we have the existing. Correct. And so you can always reference back to what was going. You can let legal know that we plan to next month tackle this much of it. Okay. 
Sounds good. Any other questions, concerns from committee members? Could you? Oh, sorry. Yes. Could you? Could y'all make sure that whatever y'all have hard copies of, put in my box, please. Well, Councilor Moore, they'll get them in your box. And if you have a need for those to be delivered to your home, if you'll call me, I'll, I'd be more glad to come take it in your box to you, okay? Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, utility Ordinance Chapter 26. Robert Glenn. Okay. You have to set some ground rules on the red binders and the green binders. Do not use the supplies from the red binders and the green binders, <laughs> or the world will come to an end. Okay? No. I'll go home just to do it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so this is just, uh, just like what Abraham just did. This is the wastewater section of our ordinance, Article 3. This is just kind of here for discussion. Uh, so you know, sections 2670 through 2680, that's all new stuff. Uh, Division three industrial waste starting at 2690, that is all copied from the current ordinance. Mostly because I have no clue what they're talking about. <laughs> I don't play with the stinky stuff. I don't know about the stinky stuff, but Andrew's here if you have any questions. There was a question on the commodity charge. Whenever you see something that says commodity charge, it's whatever, whatever will work. It's either gallons of wastewater, gallons of water. And I think that's probably, a, uh, we'll change that commodity in there just so it's a little bit easier to use. Councilor, I uh, forgot your name, I'm sorry. That's okay, you can call me Vivian. It's not. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's embarrassing, I apologize. That's okay, that's okay. Mr. Glenn, let me ask you on this commodity charge, are we um, currently charging a fee for this or is this going to be a new fee? We do charge a fee for the commodity and it's based on your water rate. Okay. Okay. So it's not something new. No. And that's one thing that if there's a new fee in here, I will highlight it in red because my goal is not to make the fee increase. Okay. Just kind of it's justify where it goes and how it's used. You're just clearing, cleaning up the language. Yes. Roger. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. Like I said, this is this is one that we'll bring back next month for a little bit deeper discussion, and Andrew will be here then too. Okay. One thing that you'll notice between this one and the old one is there's some tables that I took out. Those tables will end up being appendices. That way, if we have to change it, we don't have to change the whole ordinance. We can just change the appendices. And those that kind of stuff changes whenever the EPA decides to do something different. Okay. That'll make it a little easier to change stuff. Did we need to go through their slides? No, that's the next one. Okay. Oh, that's good. Councillor Best or Councillor Moore, either one of you? No, sir. They're gonna make me do fun. Sounds fun. Yeah. Just okay. don't mix the supplies. <laughs> Is there like uh, a blue dye in there somewhere? We'll you'll find out. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Moving forward uh, with the chapter 24 on regular items for action. Mr. Glenn. So this is the action items for chapter 26, article one and article two. These are the ones that you've had for a while. And basically we'll just, I have them all listed here on the slides. We'll go through and see if there's any problems with any of them. We can do it. Fairly quickly, I think. Uh, so the first one, Division One, uh, seventy talks about the applicability. Uh, the next one, character of service, defines more or less what what we're doing. Oh, hold on, I'm in the wrong one. Ah, uh, you're you're speaking. Yeah, I, 
Nothing's trying to do wastewater. Okay. I've got in purpose happening. Go ball ordinance. Okay. This is what we're doing and why we're doing it. Second section is the authority. If you look in there, it it quotes where we have the authority in Mo in uh, yeah Montana state statute in New Mexico state statute where we get the authority from to do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. The next one is the authority to enforce. That says who can enforce the the chapters of this or the sections in this chapter. Uh, two two. This is a, a new one. The utility director and his designated employees possess and require possessing the required operator certificates or utility department employees working under direct supervision of a certified operator shall have the sole authority to operate the water and wastewater system of the city. Operational decisions of the utility director are final. That, we call that the Flint, Michigan clause, because that's what caused the problem there, is they had elected officials, appointed officials that did not have certifications, making decisions that they should not have been making. And that was one of the things that they got cited for by the EPA. So as um, a couple of things, as we walk through this, and this is an, an, a knock, it's just preferences, all it is. I would like to see things that we're adding that are any changes. I'm sort of a red line uh, version. So anything new, just in red. It's all new. I, I, I know, but I'm talking about like this highlighted area uh -huh. you've got here. And uh, and then a, a statement of, uh, of bringing, so, so like this happened in Flint. Um, are you saying that from because of that, that there, what, what decisions are we dealing with? The director had the designated employees possessed their part of certificates or utility department employees, workers under the direct supervision of the shall be, have the sole authority to operate the water and wastewater system of the city. How, I, I know what you're saying happened in Flint. How will this, is there anything within constitution or statute of New Mexico that prohibits no, in fact, if you look at the reference underneath this, that's what requires it. Because it basically says that you have to be a certified operator to run a system. And then if you guys have problems with what the utility director is doing, that is your job to take care of that problem. But it's, yeah. <laughs> the subsections of the statute, uh, allow for employees to have fi final sole authority as well? No, the employees don't have, the employees have the authority to operate. The operational decisions of the are the utility director. So the authority that I you're think, giving is- I your language, I get it now. Thank you, yeah. So, you know, you have to be technically to be a, to go out and shut off a mainline valve you should be certified mm -hmm. because you have to know what that's going to do to the system. What are the problems it could cause? You have to know what you're doing. Okay. All Any right. Questions on that one? Questions? No, sir. No, sir. Yes. The next one is the jurisdiction and applicability. Uh, number four talks about existing regulations and how they work with this. Any questions on that page? Are we happy with that? Okay. Because that's the next thing that'll happen is this will come back to you with the red lines like you were talking about. It'll, anything that we change okay. on this will come back to you in red lines. Okay. Division 2, 26.5 is the minimum standards. Talks about how we, you know, how we do things and what the purpose of this ordinance are. We always have to have the severability clause that says just because one section is bad doesn't mean the whole thing is bad. Uh, we have the intent, why we're doing it. Headings, illustrations, and text, lists and examples. I do have a question under lists and examples. Okay. That's just not something I'm used to seeing in a lot of ordinances. Um, how how that? 
because an example is not really the ordinance. It's just uh, but you can reference you can reference standards in your ordinances. We do it all the time with fire code. Okay. And what it is is if if we have something in here, it'll reference an AWA standard or a WEF standard, or I, uh, that that makes sense. Man, just make sure we were setting example. Uh, Mr. Smith, X, Y, and Z. That's, you know, that's what I was. Yeah, it has to be specific okay. in the ordinance of what the example is. All right. Anything else? The computation of time. That is another one that kind of caught the guys in Flint is because there were some of them that were arguing time and date. So you put that in there to describe how you computate the time. 11, we can reference other regulations, uh, publications and documents. And we do that quite a bit, especially with AWWA, because they're kind of the ones that set the standard. Okay. Uh, 12, delegation of authority. And that basically gives Lorenzo the right to delegate the, his different authorities to different people or take them away, which hopefully will happen soon. Technical and non-technical terms kind of says where we get those, those definitions from. The mandatory and discretionary terms, shall, will, may. It's important to know the difference between what those are in the ordinance. Shall that you will do it, or you may do it, and must. Defining conjunctions, I found that interesting. That got put into it with a lawyer that was working with in West Yellowstone. And tenses and plurals, the same thing. Okay. Any questions? If not. Division three is other provisions, talks about how we repeal or amend things and that this will, how it's gonna work with uh, new stuff. Uh, delivery of notice, except as may be provided herein, notice of the city to a customer will be given orally by telephone or in writing. So those are the three ways that we can, we can contact a customer when you get further into the ordinance, there are some things that say that you may do it by telephone, you may do it in person. There's other things that say that you will do it in writing. Okay. It says we're, we're gonna comply with the regulations, especially the plumbing code. Written communication required. In the event of a dispute, only written communication will be considered as proof of notice. Once it gets to being a dispute or a problem, we need to, that's when we need to start documenting. Uh, 21, tampering with, obstructing, operating, damaging water or wastewater infrastructure. This is basically about the same as what's in the current code, that you can't mess with stuff. If it's ours, it's ours and you can't play with it. The next one is, is new to, yes. So, I know we've dealt with this before uh, when it comes to licensed plumbers and, and uh, uh, they get a phone call, somebody's got a, a or something that they come and they, they have, they turn off the, the shut off the water. Yes. So it, are they going to have to sit there and watch the water run and wait for they, someone from the city of Roswell to come out and take care of that? Ordinance now they're not allowed to do that. Right. Now we were showing uh, showing Councillor Arnold today our new meter boxes that we're putting in. We're actually putting the valve for the customer on the outside of the meter box. The ordinance has said for years that the customer is required to have their own cutoff. It's just something that people don't do. Now the one thing that we could we could actually fix that and say that if you are licensed, if you are a licensed individual, then you could do that. That way a licensed plumber could. Because if they do something wrong, we can hold them responsible for that. And if they don't want to deal with it, <laughs> we can go to that. Is that something you would like added in there? I think it's 
don't know that I necessarily want to add it, but I think it's worthy discussion. Um, I think that that would probably, before I, I say one way or the other, probably a good conversation for you to have with the attorney. So, you know, you know that would probably be a good consideration. I just know that uh, I have had, uh, when, when the city in the past has had uh, considerations of uh, enforcement, they've had, uh, plumbers have had concerns, just like what we talk about with the, uh, uh, the meters for checking out that kind yes. of thing, but the, the difficulty in that, but I think we've worked that out as well. And in different places that I've worked, we, we've typically allowed licensed individuals to operate stuff. Yes. Because if they do something wrong, first of all, they know the rules. Second of all, if they do something wrong, the city has recourse against it, right, through the state, through their licensing. So that would be something very easily to add in there. I think that's worthy of consideration. Okay. Again, if you have that conversation with our legal department, I think about this next month would be good. Okay, moving on. I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. Um, I just don't want us to move past this page and then I'll forget. On the section 26-18 delivery of notice, I wanted to make sure I understand what type of notice are you referring to because a, a lot of that, more of a CYA, CYA mechanism, a lot of things should be in writing. So, so what that does is it just establishes that those are the three ways that we do notifications. Well, as, we, as we go back through like a delinquency notice, that will be mailed. Okay. And that's, that's how we establish it further on is those specific notices, as you see them come up, it will say how that notice can may be delivered. Okay, so the, the word or, I guess what I'm saying is I actually feel these things should be in, uh, always in writing as far as if they're delinquent or and that's why I'm asking you what actually, you know, if you just have someone calling on the phone to say, you know, we're on our way. That's not, I mean, giving notice that we're coming. But uh, that's why having a little more definition on this, because if it's orally by telephone or in writing, and you call them and say you're delinquent, but didn't put it in writing, um, but I, I would like this to be actually looked at by legal as well, just to make sure we do a, a better CYA. And I, I understand what you're saying. And like I was saying, back when we get into some other stuff, mm -hmm. it will say how that specific notice will be delivered. Okay. This is just saying that these are the three ways that we were, that the ordinance is allowed to deliver notices. Okay. And then a delinquent notice, it'll say that it must be delivered 10 days prior to shut off by registered mail or certified mail or that kind of stuff. All right, very good. I just wanted to bring that up, thank okay. you. Obstructing department off. Next one, obstructing department operations. It shall be unlawful for any person to willfully obstruct department operations or employees by means of intimidation, physical force, or interference, or if by any independent unlawful act, he prevents access to the water meter, obstructs access to any element of city water, wastewater infrastructure, prevents any department employee from uh, performing their lawful duties, purposely provides false information on any department form or application for service, and purposely provides false information to any department employee relating to the status of their bill account during non-payment disconnection operations. Are you sure you've covered it? I don't know. <laughs> because this is just the list of problems that we're having now. It seems like as soon as we figure a way to take care of a problem, somebody thinks of something else. All right, here you go. amend it. All right. Mostly what, what this is for is when we have people that park their car on top of their water meter because they know we're coming to shut it off. <laughs> then they find out we have other means. Okay. Next up, we have a CDL driver. They can come and put Yeah. We have a gravel truck. We have a, we have a gravel truck that can move stuff. <laughs> I have a question for you on definitions. Okay. The next, the next section is the definitions. Do you want all of the definitions for the entire ordinance in one section, or do you want it defined in different sections? I think that having it all at the is pertinent. Okay. 
add it to the screen. And that's, that's easy to do. So, okay, we'll have all the definitions in front. <clears throat> so this is just all the definitions that we have right now. Okay. The next one is Article 2, Water Service. Are we okay with Article 1, except with what we discussed? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Article 2. These are the regulations that establish how we're going to furnish water. We have residential and commercial. <coughs> and it talks about living units. This next one is private wells. There's, there's lots of question on whether or not a city can prevent somebody within the city limits to drill their own well. Have we talked about this before? Yes. <laughs> you remember? That? Lewis and I have talked about this a little bit. 2015 or 16. Yeah. So <laughs> we've already had counseling since then. What we're what we're not going to do is say that we won't allow it because I reading the state law, I don't think we can do that. But we can discourage it, and we can file a protest when somebody tries to do it if we feel that it's going to affect the water right that we have. And we definitely have to prevent them from attaching their well to our system. Right. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's important. I think Liz convinced me of that as we were walking through it. I'm thinking of one specific place we dealt with this. Um, you got to make sure that we keep those separated. So that's that's basically what this talks about. Is there any problems with that? No, and, and it's not that I think that everybody in town ought to go drill a well until there's a constitutional change. I think that we're, we're stuck with both. Yeah. Like I said, you know, if it's not going to cause us any problems, fine. Do what you want to. You know, you can drill down and you can spend, I don't know how many thousands of dollars to drill your own well and fine. Mm -hmm. All right. $37 a foot case. And that's if you can find the good stuff where you're at. That seems cheap. Uh, 34. Connection. Yep. Residential connections. If you're if you have a if you have a building that is for human habitation or occupancy, you're gonna be connected to the system. Tapping of city mains. The only people that can tap a city main is the utility department or an authorized contractor on a project. We don't necessarily want everybody out there with stuff in our main lines. Am I, if I'm misreading uh, under the utility department or their authorized project contractor shall make a tap connections to the city water main, should it be take out the word A or take out the plural of connections? Or am I reading it wrong? make should probably be tap connections. Take that A out. If I may. Gentlemen, this is the one I was mentioning to you that I felt that it should be more definitive on, oh, like by adding the word only. That's something I'll get, I, oh, of course, to ask, for, in my opinion, to ask legal because the fact that it, it's kind of open ended. I get that you're saying tapping of city mains, the utility department or their authorized project contractor shall make tap connections to the city's water main. But it doesn't also, it doesn't exclude anyone either. It doesn't, by saying no one else or only, you provide exclusion. So that's why- So you want the board only added yeah. or the utility department, only the utility department or their authorized project. Correct. Other than maybe? Yes. No one other than? Yes. Okay. That's why I, I wanted it to no, I think that's, that's good. Good catch. Got hey. that? Uh, customer piping. The piping system on the customer's premises shall be inspected and approved by the city plumbing inspector. That's required now. Before the water service will be connected, proof of inspection is required with the plumbing inspector's approval. We work with Gus all the time on this. Before we connect, they have to have their stuff done. Cross connection or backflow uh, possibilities revealed in any inspection shall be eliminated before water service is provided to the new customer or continue to an existing customer. 
city does not assume responsibility for piping inspections and shall not be held liable for failure of the customer's piping or installation. Now, the customer shall not be responsible for stoppages or obstructions or breaks in facilities or lines of the customer. We're not responsible for their stuff. Okay. Now, that being said, there are times when we are working on a meter or something like that and we break something on their side, we do repair that. Contrary to popular belief. The customer is required to have a water shutoff valve installed between the meter and the customer's premise. That has always been a requirement. The city is not responsible for excess pressure in lines, and it is recommended that each customer have an operational uh, pressure control valve. That's not a big, a big of a deal here as it is in some places, because our pressure is pretty constant with the water tanks and everything the way we have it. You don't have real high fluctuations. And it shall be the responsibility of the customer to perfect the meter, meter box, and their piping from freezing. Any questions? <laughs> the next one talks about new connections. Uh, the highlighted stuff there is an edit issue that I need to fix. And it talks about temporary construction service, permanent service, who's responsible for what, and who pays for that? All right. Question on that area. Mm -hmm. Thank you, George. Okay. We go to the next slide. Sections 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, and 43. I would propose that we remove from this article and have all of the rate information in an article by itself. <laughs> Does anybody have any problems with that? I'm not sure. So you're saying we remove these completely? Yes. Okay, and then it's just all under. It, then we'll, at this point, it's it's pointing them to a fixed schedule, right? Yes. And so, what, as you mentioned earlier, if we had to amend anything, it would mend. So, okay. I That's what, if we take all of the rate information and then we'll put it in Article 5 or whatever, we'll do water rates, we'll do wastewater rates, and that kind of stuff in there. That way, if there's any problem, we only have to mess with one article. If we have to change fees, they'll all be in the fee schedule, and all we have to change is that. What, an article under 26, correct? Yes. Okay. It'll be an, I was gonna say, just please make five. Five. stay within, because I won't, I, we, we worked very hard when I very first came on to the council, we have a committee called, uh, uh, Planning and Zoning Committee, and we worked really hard. Judy Stubbs was the chair of that to take everything because seemed like somebody would come in, they'd say, well, you need this and you're going to need that and take that paper and that paper to try to combine everything into one. one package for everybody that takes what I'd like to be able to do is when we get done with this, you can look down down your table of contents and go rates. Okay. And everything's there that you need to know about rates. Um, water service, everything that you need to know about the water service. So 37 through? 37 through 43. All right, so keep moving then. Uh, in there is the section about impact fees. And you got the information that I handed out on that. Uh, I had questions about what cities in New Mexico charge impact fees, and it's basically everybody but us. <laughs> and we definitely don't want to do like Albuquerque does because it, it costs $10,000 in impact fees just to build a house. So it's, so 40, interruptions. 44, interruption of service. That says that we try not to do it, but if we have to do work on our system, we do have the right to interrupt service and they can't demand restitution for that. 45, that will go along with our conservation program, but it's basically if something happens, we can tell people you're only allotted however many gallons per day. But that would have to take an act of the council to make that happen. Oh. 
43. So, so, excuse yes. me. So on 45, can you add in there that it takes the act of the governing body? Yes. Because I just don't, and I understand it because of drought, so forth and so on. You know, Albuquerque's got their 321 or whatever they call it, advertisement, but. So typically if we do that, what we will write in there is that it will be, that we'd take it to the governing body unless it's an emergency, and then the utility director, if our tanks up on country club collapse, he has the right to do that until we can call an emergency meeting of the council. That's understood. Okay. Right of ingress and egress says that we can go on people's property to take care of stuff, but we have to show proper credentials. <laughs> Leak credit. I don't like leak credit. But, you... but it's it's something that we're gonna be stuck with. I think that's that will probably be something that we will move into the rate section. And thus we do a complete section on just leak credit. 48 is the private use of fire hydrants and standpipes. Basically, you're not allowed to do that unless you get a permit. And that's what we do now. I assume your standpipes is not the same as the ranch standpipe. No. Oh. In fact, we could probably take standpipe out. It's just one of in the standard, it says hydrants and standpipes. So, number 49, the resale and transfer of water. I sent that information out to you. What is the pleasure of the body? Councilor. I don't think it needs to be resold. So, then how do we? Bet your contractors. Not just contractors, there's a whole lot of stuff. We have a whole bunch of those little kiosks around town that there's people that depend on that for their water. How also do you, uh, and I don't know how all of this works with uh, public machines. It needs to be stuff regulated. At, uh, McDonald's and different things, but is that is that is the water that's added to carbonation or is it if it's if it's in a restaurant, anything like that, that's governed under state law under their sanitation requirements. Okay. What this is talking about is like the kiosks where you can go out and, and fill your bottle. The windmills, they've got one down here at Walgreens, they have them over here at Albertsons. But we discuss potential of testing, Correct. requiring testing. So where we And then we that. wanted licensed testers to go out. And we don't have to worry about that because it's not required by the state. So we we're, we don't have to require, it's whatever you guys decide that we require is what we require. Councilor Arnold. Okay, so I'm just gonna make, I'm, I have like a million things going through my head. Um, so you, let me make sure I'm clarifying. You're saying that the this right here notes that the people at the kiosk cannot resell the water. Is that is that how this? That's the way it's written now. That's the way it's written now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I no. I want the people in the kiosk to be able to sell water. Okay. So with if that's what we want to do, then do we want to regulate it or do we not want to regulate it? What are, what are the, what are the risks? I'm sorry. You no. have the floor. Uh, you might be asking a good question that was already in my head. So go ahead. <laughs> What are what are the what are the uh, liabilities if we do not require? There is no li according to the state. There is no no liability on the city. So have we done any regulation up to this point? No. Have we had any issues up to this point? No. Okay. I see. Also, just not to interrupt you, but uh, we did get an email from. Tanya Cahill stating that the responsibility of the kiosk is on operators to what's selling and what. And you guys did have that in your books. So I, I say no, no reason to. There's no problems in this. So do you want to allow it by 
permit so we know at least who's doing it or do we just allow it allow it by business license business business license or permit either either one would be appropriate i would think i think both both i think you should have a permit to resell the water and i think you should have the business license for the city i also think that it should be tested if you want through the city every quarter i think my biggest question is compliance we our code who enforces that that's already a lot to enforce i mean that would be under our water conservation person okay and how many do we have of those one <laughs> yes Chantel. but i think there's there's your ice machines and your windmills around town and i don't think a quarter you know every quarter they take a sample take it out to the water out there and have them test it and then put it on file <laughs> and if they don't have it by the next year you don't present them with another city license Okay. And, and my my personal thought, and that's just to really cover our ass if somebody puts cyanide or something in it, just saying. Well, I go, Councilor, I think in case I misunderstood, we don't hold the liability if somebody puts arsenic in the water. Is that correct? If they're selling. That's what the state's telling us right now. But you know that we're going to get sued because. Yeah. My, my concern is this. Here, here's my problem. Yeah, we're going to get sued regardless. I get that. Yeah. So the, my concern is if we do require the testing and then it falls through and, and they don't um, send it and then there is something in the water, then we do hold a liability yes. for not enforcing. Uh, so I would rather if right now state says there's there's th 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 that we're uh, uh, hold harmless if you want to say I'd soon leave, leave a dead dog lying you know uh, you know leave it there that's just my thought I, if you want to do it through permitting to 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 say you know that they have to uh, that they have to have a permit to do so then maybe put as a portion of that permit that they have to be they have to be a, a registered uh, holding a business license and then they can receive a permit to do so I think I'm okay with that but if the state says we don't have a liability, I'd like to keep it. So permits, permits is there to allow somebody to do something specific. Mm -hmm. If we just require them to have a business license, then we know who's doing it. Mm -hmm. And I would not go with a permit. That's fine with me as well. Fine. But sure. if we ever go to any kind of, you know, like you were saying, we want to test it, stuff like that. That's when we go into a permitting section because for the permit, we can put down the requirements for the permit. Yeah. Mr. Chair? Yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, also you have your restaurant or restaurant or joint that's uh, has a city business license for that restaurant. But in addition to that, they have the kiosk on outside that building. So their business license will actually be for the restaurant. That's just additional service that they're providing is that kiosk. So they probably don't have us wouldn't have a separate business license for that kiosk. At this time, it should be listed on their business license that they have the restaurant and a water machine. You know, however, we want to do it. I bet it's not there. We could check. We could find well, and if it's not, then we could start requiring you know, your Albertsons and Walmart. Yeah, your grocery stores are going to have that issue too. Yeah. So. As long as we're, we're clear that the state says we don't have a liability, I'd soon leave that alone. Okay. Is there a consensus? Yeah, sure. Okay. Just, so only requirement would be a business license, right? Okay. Well, the business license needs to include that they have the kiosk. Yes. Because like Albertsons, uh, your restaurant. Okay. If you're wanting to keep track of them. Yes. I mean, hey. And that wouldn't that way if they have that and they enter that in Tyler with that specific code, then we can go in and get a report and it shows us who has it. In theory. The next one talks about meters and how we go about getting the meters, testing meters, if there's a problem. 
Uh, section C, you know, it'll talk about, you know, we, we require that meter to be within 2% of accuracy. And these new meters can meet that. Are they? Yes. So far, the ones that we've pulled and tested were good. Okay. We do have some that are acting a little weird, and we're working with the customers on those, and we've sent it back to the vendor to find out what's going on. But it's only it's two meters. We're not quite sure what, what's going on. What else you got? Flushing. Flushing of premises lines. It just talks about how you can flush the lines on a, a new house, new building, and how that works. Illegal use of water. We have to have that nice little cannabis statement in there for our grants. And then liability for city, liability for city leakage or uh, breakage. Basically, if it's our fault, we'll take care of it. It's not our fault. It's not. And that's one of the things I don't think most of you know with we go out and damage personal property. We don't run necessarily always run it through the torque clean process. Most of the time I go out there, look at it. We have one of our contractors look at it, get a price and fix it. That way, you know, the customer doesn't have to go through all the process or something we did wrong. Uh, I, jumping back up to illegal use of water once again is the, is the, um, uh, the siding there, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation Advisory, May of 2014, is that where they would find that specific? Yes. Okay. Want to make sure. And your reclamation is standing by that. Okay. All right. So my suggestion would be bring this back to us next month with the updated section 2649 uh, with the consideration uh, the updated 2634-1. There's a couple of other little places. Um, 2621, and then your next section. Yep, so the next section that will be on for action next month will be the wastewater section. This will be moved to red line. And then if there's any problems with that, we can always bring the red line back. And then there will be a final going over at some point. You know, we might break it down to like five chapters or something. And then we'll, we'll go over all the red lines and make sure we're still good. And then legal wants the red line so they can make sure, so it's not going back and forth. Right. They wanna take the red lines, make sure that the, the suggestions and stuff that we put in there aren't causing us any problems. Right. And they'll let us know if there's any so my My suggestion would be to take what we've just given today, bring that back to us next month in a, in a revised uh, portion. Then your next section that you're want, gonna want us to deal with us vote to to approve that portion. Yes, uh, this portion here at the next meeting. Does that make sense? Okay. So really, I, I don't see taking action today on this. You bring that writing back to us. We approve that on the next one, and then look. What I what I need approval on is the red lines. Mm -hmm. This is what we talked about. This is what you want to do, and we're good with that. I think we have consensus that what we've discussed is correct. Okay. Report on consensus. The one thing that we'll always end up doing is, you know, we'll be down in in Division Five doing something, uh -huh. and we'll find that we have to go back to Division One and work on team sporting or something. That's going to come, I'm sure. As we. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Glenn brought up the budget billing. I have that. Um, I, I kind of noted, I actually think it's something that we should really discuss. I don't know when timing, appropriate timing is. Thank you. Um, I did send all of this in an email, but um, I, I sent it to you. Well, I responded to his. Okay. I do you guys, you're all, I, so you. when I attached it, it's everyone has it. That way you would have the access to the links. You could actually see that, um, most of our utilities around us are doing this. It's something that to consider. But of course, I don't know uh, when we want to fit it in. It just I wanted to make sure because It'll probably come in during great discussion. I was going to say when we get to great okay. discussion. Um, and 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 when we you sit with this, I sent down a little bit today to change. Wrap my head around it as well. 
uh, I, I, I'm perfectly comfortable as long as we're looking at this like Excel and, and the gas companies where it's not a required, but in the and choice, yes, option. So, mm -hmm. I, absolutely, a lot of people, it's, it's easy for them to deal with a budget if they have a more organized way. And according to Jamie, we can do this. However, we've got to have the most updated version of Tyler to do so. So it will take some. Well, so just you know, when I was doing the research for this, I got a lot of the information from US News and it actually talked about the software. The first software that came up was Tyler. So um, it, I think it's actually, we're, we're currently positioned to, to transition to, to do this, um, and, but it's definitely worth it, the discussions. Um, like I said, my, one of my biggest concerns is providing a budgeting tools for our elderly. So anyway, I just want to make sure that that was So yeah, that's, I think that'd be a really good thing to do. The other thing at some point that I will be bringing to you is a, an idea of having a, an emergency fund. For people you have the gas company our company does that now where you're able to donate so much money into the emergency fund and that's for if somebody has a a one month issue what we found a lot on these uh shutoffs and stuff when i've gone gone out and talked to people is they got behind one month because they had family emergency a medical thing happened and then they just couldn't ever get caught up again and if you go back and look, they have a good history with us, but they just, once they were behind that one month, they could never get caught back up. All right. Yep. Okay. So if you guys are good with that, I'll, I'll be putting that in somewhere too. Right. And as it comes to yeah. Okay. That's all I had, I believe. All right. Uh, I think now all well, the questions that we needed. So. 36 inch main break at 603 East Alameda. This is when you can get mad at your utility director. <laughs> Mr. Chair, committee members, uh, we're back again. We brought this ready a couple of times, just informational. A 36 inch water main break at 603 East Alameda. I did talk to Robbie with Smithco today. He did finally get the parts in for that to get it repaired. Uh, he's going to give me a schedule when they can come start working on that repair. I haven't got that date yet, but uh, we did get a quote, which was included in here, which was $49,500 plus uh, gross receipts tax, which brought it to $53,006.09. Uh, this is coming out of our regular operating fund, so we're not going to need any budget adjustment. We did find the uh, money within the water admin account already, so we will not require any additional funding so far. So, you guys have any more questions? It's really under the sixty thousand dollar threshold, so we really don't need to have to run it through council. I think there's a hillbilly comedian to quote that says, "Get her done." Get her done. <laughs> Get her done. Yeah, we just like keep the of course infrastructure and the finance committee informed of what's going on through the process, Absolutely. even even though it's below the threshold. All right. Any other questions on that? On no. that and some bits. So, in your Mr. Chairman Committee, we had Chad before you uh, requesting your recommend award of ITB-23-011 North Atkinson Rehab Project to Constructors Incorporated. In the amount of three million three hundred thirty-five thousand nine hundred thirty-six dollars and eight cents, which includes GRT. If you've looked in the packet, uh, this is significantly above the engineer's estimate, above the budget, based on the current bid market in Roswell. I don't see it getting any better. Because where there was a day we would have another bidder bidding on this, that bidder is no longer bidding on us, mm -hmm. and the other contractors know that. So I would suspect that the prices would keep going up. Correct. So based on that, uh, again, I recommend when I do, I have this also on finance for the money. 
Awesome. So let's just prove it's in full council. So I agree. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> choice. I mean, so we can do a couple of things here. You can approve it here. I also have it going to finance committee. If you don't want to do anything here, I also have it a finance committee. I also want to tell you, I will not be at council in April. Chicken. Chicken. <laughs> you gonna lie? Damn. So, but I will be at finance committee. Um, all right, committee members, what do you say? Put it to full, full council. Do you agree, Ms. Christina? Uh, no, I actually think it should go to finance. It is going to finance already. Okay. I've already made. You're going to if you. It's going to both committees. Okay. And my my reason there was, of course, this money is a big chunk. But since I'm not going to be at April uh, Council, infrastructure will hear it, finance will hear it, and hopefully there will be enough information disseminated so we can, you guys can make a decision on full council, full council under the governing body. Uh, interesting fact: uh, had Thomas break up the bids. Uh, when you take the bid items, it's 52% utility work. It's 48% uh, road work. If you notice the two bidders, constructors is not a utility contractor, so they subbed it all out. And Adame is a utility contractor and they subbed all the roadway work out. There is no contractor currently bidding on our stuff that has both capabilities. And we'll go to finance committee. Uh, Lorenzo and I have agreed that the overrun or the extra money will be split 50-50 between road fund and utility fund. Okay, can I just say, <laughs> and as kindly as I know how to say it, that I think that this is a first of uh, many upcoming surprises when it comes to costs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll leave her there, but I bet we'll see some significant uh, rises in the in, in uh, the cost of these kinds of work, especially dealing with some of our contracted uh, water as well. We're going to see some. Uh, I think that uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this goes. Uh, but, uh, on the Mr. Engineer, at the same time, we if, uh, if if we choose as a council to reject and not move forward, as I see here, we lose 2.5 million from the state. That is correct. Our roads are in bad enough shape, you know. The, you know. And we're almost to that. This is the last little piece to get in that get yeah. Atkinson corridor pretty well taken care of. What's your pleasure, committee? Go ahead, Ms. Christina. Okay. Can I make this a little bit easier? Yeah. Can I make it a statement? Uh, I think that anything that's already budgeted that does come forward to to full council, I mean, I mean to this committee, we we plug along straight to um, uh, full council. I think that we had a situation with the the equipment this last month where we were on a deadline. We either jumped on that and got that to full council, or we were going to lose the ability to get that vehicle. I'm not, I, yeah, I'm all for full council at this point. Once I understood that it was already going to finance, I personally was just figuring out how to say it. Okay. <laughs> the stalling was. <laughs> if we want to have it said, uh, of the, just as a suggestion that we move to full council uh, to approve uh, the bid with the constructors for the amount there. Okay. Uh, that, okay. You know, pay, uh, with the presentation, recognizing that finance will have a pending. Uh, okay. Determinations, but I'll try to see if I can get it. 
Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to a, a recommend award of North Atkinson Rehab Project to Constructors Inc. in the amount of 3.335936.08 million, which includes DRT to full council. And I'm trying to think how to get the finance part in there. Uh, with recognition with that rec finance will be will be making a recommendation okay. for or against as well. With recommendation that it will be reviewed by finance as well. Second. We have a motion and a second for the uh, to war uh, to send full council. I'm assuming this is it for the uh, consent. Uh, for constructors uh, in three million three hundred thirty-five thousand nine hundred thirty-six dollars and eight cents, recognizing uh, that the finance committee will be giving a recommendation for or well. We had a discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 All the same sign. Motion passes. Engineering lab remodel bids. Next slide. Keep asking. Okay, so the city will be, I mean, engineer will be moving into the old municipal uh, courtroom. What's wrong with <laughs> The lights work, they're just on the floor. It kind of looks like Lewis's office. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so that happened last year in the summer and nothing happened so was that from a water damage or what was that from that was some yeah water damage from uh one of those 100 year events that we had oh all right okay so with all the changes that have been happening engineering is going to move uh and take over that we put out bids for a remodel uh we've already had money to and they're doing it right now to replace the roof and then take out all the mold and all that kind of stuff, the remediation. There was no uh, uh, pool of vendors to do remodels. I think you have that on your, you'll see that on your council package somewhere uh, coming up this in April. But this is the reason, one of the reasons to have a pool of contractors, you could just get this done and get the PO. We had went out to bid, got one bid, uh, cuts in construction. It is within the budget. We do have the budget in our budget right now, so we're just recommending uh, this can go to consent and keep on going. Have we have we moved? I know Main Street's out of it, but uh, the uh, I know they were putting up the. I saw. I guess it was Saturday when I saw they were putting up the uh, the tower on the North on Central. That is correct. So they're out. They're out. In fact, that right now. Everything's been gutted. All the partitions are down. The the back the counters, the toilets, the sinks, everything. Every time we get to a place, tear this thing down. Somebody else wants it. Mm -hmm. The judge tried to tear it down years ago. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Took a sledgehammer to the front of it so he could get church pews in the building. <laughs> but uh, uh, all right, that's where we're at with this one. Make a motion to send a consent agenda to recommend awarding ITB-23-018-405 North Richardson Remodel Project to Custom Construction LLC in the amount of $116,451.52, which includes GRT. Okay. We have a motion and a second to send. I'm not gonna repeat all that. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Spring, uh, Spring Creek Cielo Trail Connection options. Again. Take a deep breath. Janine's been doing this as long as I have. Uh. So, what we have before you, uh, let me see the rest of it. Oh, oops. Over the years, we looked at other options. We're down to option one or option two. Option one will require a bridge over the arroyo. Right now, option two is the recommended. Two different things. Well, those that have been around, this the it's been rejected. Council, I don't know you're the only one that hasn't been around. 
It's been rejected, these other options, because not in my backyard, not in my front yard. Not on my side yard. Our side yard either. <laughs> we have option two, two things different this year. Uh, it's not in anybody's backyard, not in anybody's side, side yard. It is on the on A Street, uh, but we also have the funding from the DOD. So this did go to uh, General Services. General Services recommended it uh, to agree with option two. So again, I won't be at council in April. I'm just going into two different count, uh, committees to make sure everybody's aware of what's going on. We, if it does crash and burn like the other ones have, we're like, done. We're done, and we'll give the money back to the DOT. That's not good for a future recommend future application. I stand for questions. Committee members, before I say anything, go for it, Chase. Do you have anything? No, I what I what I would have would open up a can of worms and I think we'd need a dinner but, with it. So um yeah, I can get history later. We can open it if we need to because I I, I um I wasn't around for some of the rejections, so I don't blame anyone. I'm not here to blame anyone, but um uh, I, I and I hate to be a uh balloon popper party crash or whatever the word is. I just have my concerns are so great about it right there up against that road on 8th Street and the golfers on the Oh, we've side. been through that. We have been through all of that. I don't think and they the insist route, so. on putting people out on 8th Street and letting them play tag and chase. I, I, I just have concerns on that. When we looked at it and had us breathe earlier, it's more on that option one. But then there's that bridge that has to go across that arroyo there. Um, I, I have, and, and I didn't bring all these up in the other meeting as it wasn't uh, my meeting necessarily, but um, my concerns are several, of course, from being right up here. I know it's a little bit away from the road, but also you got these golfers. I'm just concerned about that, uh, especially golfers like me. <laughs> but um, it's crossing here. It looks like the traffic has an opportunity for, for, for gaining speed and crossing here. You know, I, if, if we own this already, is there not the ability, if we're going to go with an option like this, is there not an ability to go across the road and then come here? It just looks like it'd be a safer crossing, but I'm not an engineer. We're looking at that option of putting it on the north side. In fact, just cross right there where it, where it hits 8th Street and go ahead and cross. Uh, it just looks like people coming to the east, they're not accelerated as fast as they will be here. People coming from the west should be slowing down to get to the, to the but um, no one goes we're going to try to squeeze it on the north side, but I mean, my, my preference still goes back to this over here of coming across and going, utilizing the alley. It just is, but I, I wasn't. I don't think I was part of the council. Well, the homeowners passed now. <laughs> oh, one of the homeowners. Yeah. Who's Not others? Huh? Not enough. Anyway. Eighth Street is a bad situation, and we've discussed that for years. We're going to make it as safe as we can. I mean, we're talking blinking pedestrian lights. I'm talking rumble strips. Uh, possibly, a, if I can afford it, a solar street light. As I did on the, if you've seen the, in Ward 1, the, where the trail hits Garden, mm -hmm. we have a solar street light there just for the. Well, I'm actually at Sierra Grande every single morning with my father. I'm exposed to the people that are out there running freely along college all the way around because they're super athletes and remind me that I'm supposed to be there. Um, I do think I remember this conversation. I think, was it at the library, the Bondurant room? I think there was one there. Who created option two? Was that the engineering department? Option two was part of, uh, well, it was part of the engineering department, but also when we did the Bondurant room, is yeah. a, 
is the pedestrian and bicycle, bicycle trail. master plan. Yeah, that may be on what I've seen. So I'll open your can of worms right here. Why not? No, I just wanted to know the history of what the, the, you actually, well, you've pointed out enough for me to understand that the, the concern was uh -huh. 8th Street and that this, you know, of course, turning it up and Right. We've, we've looked at Montana, we've looked at Mississippi. The option yeah. here, the problem was nobody was willing to give up their um, right. their parking. Well, that Montana was just as busy as 8th Street. And it, 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 it was. It was busy and with all the crossroads. That was it's gotten hard. busier in the last year, too. There was another I can't like, <laughs> Mississippi to the left of... Uh, uh, yeah. This... Just I felt was better, but I, I'm not an expert. It's safer. It that good. option is the safest option to go down the alley, go down Riverside, and then dip off into the. And, and what's happened, uh, Council Arnold? Everything passes at committee. All of them did. Right. They all fail at council. Mm -hmm. But they may not now. There's a lot of things that failed that didn't fail then. But I mean, we're down to. We, we got to do something now. How much, how much time do you have on the money from the state? Mm, I have to have this one built, I think, at the end of 24. So are you willing to take that alley and stuff back to the council? If, if we go with another option, I lose the money. So option two is our only option. Yeah, you asked me about time. You didn't ask me about the requirements of the DOT. Oh, so option two is it. So send it to good set. There you go. <laughs> See who will pull it off, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to guarantee there's not anybody up there that pull it off. You tell them that's what you want, that's what you'll get. Oh, wait. So I can't say that I. that's actually what I want. I prefer to actually have discussion from the other six. Um, so I was thinking full. I will not be there, so have fun. Right. Every time but it goes to full, it gets rejected. But it's been it's been to full council three times. Yep. And Councilor Moore has been there. It's failed it's failed every time. And it went and it went it passed the committees. Committees. Two committees, right? Two committees said yes to two. Two services. committees said yes to three. <laughs> Can we take it to public safety just, last year also? And general third. Here's a recommendation. Uh, because we're at seven o'clock. And the uh, told us she won't let us get done with this meeting. Uh, we don't care about Bob, but we want to make sure Ms. Tolson can say it. So, but, you know, we already have general services made a recommendation to send it to full council. We don't even have to make a recommendation. Okay. 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 Just like the general council, let the general services let them have it. It's, it's on the agenda already, is what I'm saying. So it's not really a reason to. Do we have to vote on it then? Negative. Let's okay. move on. Is that all right? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Good. So let's move on to the uh, MOU. Okay, so the MOU, Mr. Chairman and, and committee, uh, right? So the MOU, one of the questions, uh, the parcel map that we that the that the, the city uses and all the county uses is generated from an aerial flight. Well, every five years, typically you have to refly the the county, uh, and typically every five years, the city and the county split the bill, so we can have the aerial flight, we have the data, we have our MOU in front of us. Yes, we do talk to the county and planning and zoning with the county gets along with engineering and, and city planning, but we do get along very well. Uh, so the MOU's there, this will be on my budget request under engineering. But this is just the MOU. This is just the MOU, okay. go forward, and it will be in the budget. So when you see the budget and the MOU, this is what we're talking about. Questions? This is the uh, one that's attached to the GIS. Yes, it's going to be attached. Yeah. Entertain a motion. I a motion to send to full council the approval of the MOU to Chavez County to split the total cost for the aerial photography services, which is 
$115,119.20, resulting in the city cost of $57,559.60. Does that include GRT? Yes. That includes GRT. We have a motion, we have a second. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Now let's get to the park concept for the Spring River Corridor Foundation. Okay. Oh, time to take medicine. Wake up, Bob. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, I'm stiff when I wake up. So just start. Right. I'm Sally Cole, and Bob Edwards is here as a representative also from the Spring River Corridor Foundation. Ivan Hall was here earlier and uh, he, he had to go. But I thank you, uh, Councilman Perry, for this opportunity to present this concept to this committee. Uh, this is a little background, and most of you know this, but the Spring River Corridor Foundation was created in 1988. And our mission was to complete the Spring River Trail from Sycamore all the way to the zoo because the enchanted lands part had already been done. And this we did, it was a 10 year commitment, but we also added um, areas of interest along the way, mostly through Ivan's artistic talent. So, <laughs> but then in 1999, the foundation was the recipient of a very generous trust fund with the proviso that the funds be used primarily for bronze statuary of historical figures as related to Southeastern New Mexico. Um, we've invested these funds and it's grown through the years, uh, allowing us also to participate in the John Chisholm and the Goddard statuary and to a certain extent with uh, Pat Garrett and the bust of uh, Francisco Chavez in the courthouse. But um, <clears throat> our initial thought for the funds was to place various statuary along the trail. But uh, there's a high incident of vandalism that's in the world today. We uh, let me see. I'm going to. I'm just kind of losing my thought here. It seemed more prudent to find an area that can provide more oversight and security, and with those criteria in mind, around the parks and recreation recreation building, which is electrical resources for the camera monitoring, seemed to be a good prospect. The foundation would like to partner with the city to develop the former area into a historical sculpture garden park. The theme for this area, because we've been, <coughs> early on we were gonna try to do a Haynes, Haynes Dream project. And we had come to you about that. But this is expanding that idea. And the Haynes Dream, was created in 1890 and it was the Spring River was running full. It was 40 to 60 feet wide and 10 to 20 feet deep in parts. And there was a gazebo and they had dances all the time, 10 cents a dance. <laughs> they had uh, a little steamboat that took tours along the river floating and it was a whole 10 people at a time, and people would just stand in line to, for their turn, and the boat's name was the Katie. So we were going to try to replicate the Katie and sim some part of the city, and then when the pool went out, that just was perfect place. a perfect place right there by the, although there's no water in the, in the channel there, that's where it would be very likely to be. So um, uh, and the reason it's called Haynes Dream is Mr. Haynes was, it was his dream to have it. 
and uh, it just, uh, he, he was even sheriff at one time, so he was very entrepreneurial. <laughs> And although there's no more water, the foundation believes that by highlighting the historical aspects of Fiend's Dream, the area where the pool was can become another destination spot. We have destination spots all along the trail. We have the disc golf in the west, and then you have the bird sanctuary and, uh, you know, golf course, tennis courts, and then two museums that are accessible and on out to the zoo, but we got all of that done. It took us about two, almost three years to get permission to go under the train trestle to keep the trail consistent. So it was quite a deal, but um, I just hope that the city will embrace this idea and join us in this joint venture to the completion of a whole, I just visualized picnic tables and the gazebo and historical figures there that I think would be, I don't know if you all have seen these old pictures of the Spring River with the Katie in there. There's several of them. You can just flip through them. So what year did you take that picture? <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> But the weather, the water went dry about 1924, 25. But you know, it's important to our community that folks like you and the, and the, the board bring these things to our mind so that my children can know uh, the heritage of Roswell. And uh, y'all done y'all done such a phenomenal job. I don't know what you do next after this. Just <laughs> I retire. <laughs> But I hope you all, I just feel like that has, I mean, with the pool gone, that's a beautiful area there. It's right across from the Sunken Garden. Right. And I will tell you this, that the city was going to fill in the Sunken Garden about that time in the Spring River Corridor Foundation. Awesome. I'm glad. Well, and, and, but I think, and just if I can just open up the conversation real quickly, as you and I sat down and discussed a lot of these things, I think that's this is a, a a a huge thing because I know at one time we were even talked with the county, some county commissioners about maybe a joint venture of some sort of pavilion or something, but bringing it in with the historical value of what we have there uh, is a great thing. The gazebo, I think, is a great thing because we have the Sutton Gardens and also the potential of adding uh, to cutting this road off. Uh, to where the trail continues and there's not that concern and then having the extra parking uh, just added a lot of the value of what could really take place here uh i i, I think it's great I think. i'm excited about it i hope you all will and that that is just a conceptual built uh design that uh jim sexy and I, I, I would be remiss if I did not say that Jim Sexy and Ivan Hall are two of the most, they've done a fantastic job from the very get-go on this trail. And they need to get more credit for it, I think. Now, and just uh, some things here, Council Arnold, Councilor Betts, the red that you see there would be connecting the trail uh, to keep folks from having to go through the parking lot as they currently are. So you're adding safety value um, by, by, by us joining in with this as well. So I think I have a question. I, I think I see on this that we kept we kept the diving board rock. I'm, I'm a great, I'm Bill Horn's daughter. I know. Who you okay. Are. I am a great I know that, Bill. <laughs> I knew Bill, I should say. He wasn't too bad. He was okay for his for who he was. Anyway, <laughs> I am a great believer in the rocks over there. And and I grandmother used to talk about the sunken gardens and it being planted, and you know, she was mm -hmm. part of that concept. Are we gonna keep the diving board and are we gonna put brass plaques on it and explain some of this? Everything will have a historical explanation on it. Because I have pictures too, and I'll be glad to donate it. I would love to have some. 
And I knew your grandparents too. Grandmother, so <laughs> maybe you can tell me some stories. I could. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have anything you'd like to add? No. Just that the foundation's in favor of moving forward, right? Yes, indeed we are. And uh, just, uh, it hasn't been said that the foundation is looking at a 500,000 uh, for moving forward with the district. Okay. Yeah, oh, Jim Barris. <laughs> uh, Jim Barris has, uh, been looking, has looked at this project and has agreed to uh, make some changes in the trail just before it gets to the park's office there. We cut off and go through that where the red is. It's still up in the air about whether the red would go all the way down to the, right. to, the to Union. That platform there, the concrete from the old uh, pool deck is uh, more than adequate to be utilized. Yeah, utilize as part of the trail. I felt it was important. General Services also heard this, but I thought that it was important enough for uh, four more counselors to you know, up to, to here so we could get a, a good feeling as to. So did they send it to full council already? Yeah, I think it's been sent to full council. This was uh, specifically, I think the foundation wanted to hear and see if we want to be. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, we, we did receive some information at general services that this needs to go through legal. Yes. So what we're asking for is right. <laughs> asset center. When, when they did the repairs and, and stuff there, we, we got a situation where we rented or got for a buck to own this for a year, not own it, but to take control to do these various things that we want to do. And then when the work is completed, we will turn it back to the city. <laughs> so we'll need to go to legal so they can. So, so general service requested for the legal department to, to iron out the details to allow for us to lease this area to the foundation. Uh, for their time to be able to get. So my next question is, I assume Jim's going to work with you hand in hand and make sure that all the sprinkler systems and all that work with the city's pressure and blah, 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 blah. That was discussed as well, that everything would have to be done to the standards. So. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So, Thank uh, you all. Please forgive me if I'd have really thought of it. I'd probably just thrown y'all up. <laughs> well, I was I was gonna stay, but that it's a, it's a, it's a, I will say my hats off to you. I didn't realize you went through all of this every month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a better appreciation for your service. <laughs> I want to thank all of you. Thank you very much. Anything else from committee members, department reports, comments? Anyone online? Remember, they're in a package. No, I'm oh, Councillor Moore left at 7 05 at the minutes to reflect. Thank you. Anyone else? Any red timers? Uh, no. We didn't vote on that. It's too late. All right. Uh, let's keep going. Why are you taking them back again to add more pencils and stickers? <laughs> no, I'm going to make them. The this conference will oh, now be recorded. Salami. My trigger was dropping a little bit, and I thought, I'd need to get back to you. That was Count. my grandma. I got, okay, all right. That was a template, huh?